Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> I think it's a good afternoon. It was the cupcakes. Welcome to the right. Board of County Commissioners meeting for July 19th, 2022. Uh, this afternoon, our invocation will be led by Commissioner Janet Long. Following that, our pledge will be led by Commissioner Dave Eggers. Please rise. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, please bow your heads for a moment as we ask our Heavenly Father for uh, to recognize that we have come here as humble servants asking for his grace on us, for his wisdom to enter into our minds and our hearts and his guidance and most of all support of our efforts as we begin this meeting. Please help us, dear Lord, to engage in meaningful and respectful dialogue. Allow us to grow closer as a body, as elected officials, while we work tirelessly to nurture the bonds of our community. Fill us with your grace, dear Lord, as we make decisions that may affect our citizens, young and old, and our families throughout our county and our beautiful Tampa Bay region. Oh yes, Lord, and one more thing. Please bless uh, our county administrator, Barry Burton, and all of his most devoted staff for all of the hard work that they have done to bring this budget recommendation to us today. Please continue to remind us throughout our meeting today that all we say and do is in the pursuit of your will for truth and the greater glory of you and the service to our humanity that we all desperately want to serve. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioners. <coughs> We've got a couple of recognitions, and I'll come down for those. All right, our first recognition this morning or this afternoon is for National Parks and Recreation Month proclamation. I'd like to invite Jolanda Jordan, Senior Department Administrative Manager for Parks and Conservation Resources, and the advisory members of the Park Board to join me for the National Parks and Recreation Month proclamation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for being with us. You all can come all the way around. Good afternoon. Uh, parks and recreation programs enhance our quality of life by contributing to a healthy lifestyle, community building, economic development, and environmental sustainability. Playgrounds, nature fields, open spaces, cultural and historic sites make the community an attractive and desirable place to live, work, play, visit, and contribute to the ongoing economic vitality. The National Parks and Recreation Association and the Florida Recreation and Park Association designated July as National Parks and Recreation Month. Therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that July 2022 be recognized as National Parks and Recreation Month. I'll give you a chance to say a few words and then we'll take a photo. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, Pinellas County has a great park system that I think we can all be proud of and want to thank the Board of County Commissioners for this proclamation. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to serve on this board.
Thank you all for being here. I appreciate you all. Uh, and these are one of our favorite times. We get to recognize some of our employees for their outstanding work. Our first one is for uh, Jordan Bledinger. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, Pinellas County employees are out across our county every day protecting our residents, cleaning up our community, boosting our economy, and providing first-class services that people in Pinellas need and expect. Our employee recognition program is one way we thank them for that outstanding work. Today we have two employees to be recognized for their efforts, and we start with Jordan Blendinger, I'm going to say it three t different ways to see if we get it right which way, who is a senior field coordinator for our Public Works Stormwater and Vegetation Program. Uh, Jordan does a tremendous job examining our stormwater infrastructure, both in plans and in person, to ensure we're improving our ability to withstand heavy rains. In doing so, he's not afraid to go above and beyond his job title as well. He recently took on a leadership role in an important improvement project in Lelman and effectively communicated the plans with neighbors to make sure they truly were part of the process. I'd like to invite Jordan to come up to the podium with, while we watch a video about his role and accomplishments. My name is Jordan Bleninger and I'm a senior field coordinator for Public Works Stormwater. I go out and I inspect uh, areas that the stormwater isn't functioning or may need improvement. I go out and I take a look at those areas and see what all needs to be done in order to improve those areas. And that's anywhere from looking at the site plans to actually going out and doing a site visit and looking at it in person. As you know, we get some severe storms here. If we have a clogged drain pipe or if we have a, a grate that's been covered, it can easily back up. He inspects a lot of these before the storms come. He identifies these problem areas. He'll either alleviate the situation right there on the spot or he creates the work order to get the right team in place to ensure that that area doesn't flood in the future. It amazes me how he can take on a new assignment and just see it through from beginning to end. The key to Jordan is just tell him what you need the outcome to look like and he will get it to that point. This project, the Neri Park Pond, is just one example of the great work that Jordan does. When we got brought in, uh, the vegetation and the pond just wasn't uh, functioning like it had, like I said, it would have been 50 years. Um, the vegetation was overgrown, there was a bunch of algae in the pond. We took out all the invasive species, uh, we cleaned the pond, dredged it, and um, then we also did a planting plan and put native plants in. Uh, aquatics and uh, vegetation and trees on the banks. We saw a big difference in uh, wildlife and the turtles. Uh, there was a couple of small alligators. Fish was a big thing. And that was one of the uh, ultimate goals of it was not only to make sure that the, the pond was functioning properly, but was also to uh, create an aesthetically pleasing uh, place for residents to enjoy. Anytime projects are going on, you, you, you tend to see residents come inquire. Um, and I know specifically a few residents um, reached out to me and commented on Jordan's work. Um, just uh, his professional nature, um, just being able to uh, get back to the community, follow up on requests that they made, um, really made a big difference. I love what I do. First reason is because uh, we help the public. We not only help uh, residents create a better area, also working with individuals within the county and outside the county. Uh, it's just a, a pleasure to be able to meet different people and work with them. I'm Jordan Bleninger, and I am Pinellas County. Well, Jordan, congratulations. Um, and I think, you know, your experience in the video speaks volumes to what the public sees every day. You know, a lot of the things that we do, that's not what they experience when they're driving to work. They're driving through puddles, stuff's backing up in their yard. That's firsthand what makes their life, you know, impacts them every single day, you know. And so the work that you do and the experience, I said, if I ask you what are the, the hot spots right before a storm, I bet you could you could name them because that, that's experience, that you know where to go, you know how to help people, you know how to be out proactive 
to where we have a better quality of life. So for all your experience, all your work, dedication, I just want to say thank you and uh, that everybody really appreciates it. Um, I just want to thank uh, my family, uh, my mom and dad, and also everyone that I've worked with throughout the county that have helped me uh, achieve all my goals and uh, do what I do. Family, would you like to come up for the photo? Come on up. Our uh, next recognition uh, is for Tony Contarino, a park ranger at Brooker Creek Preserve with Parks and Conservation Resources. Tony's worked at Brooker Creek for the last five years, but he's been with the county for more than 30 years now. All of those years spent with parks. In that time, he's grown from a teenage maintenance person to one of our most experienced park rangers that others tune ter uh, turn to for support and guidance. He's friendly with guests, hardworking at keeping trails clean, and always ready to do what's needed to help anyone who enters our park. I'd like to invite Tony up here while we watch the video uh, on his accomplishments. I'm Tony Contarino. I'm a park ranger at Brooker Creek Preserve. Typically, we maintain all the hiking trails, equestrian trails. Basically, they can go out and uh, see how nice the preserve looks. We maintain everything around the Ed Center. We keep the boardwalks clean, parking lots clean. They see us out on the trails and they ask questions about the flora and fauna. I remember when I first met Tony back in the late 80s. He was uh, very energetic, quick to jump on equipment. 30 years later, he still loves operating equipment. When I come into work in the morning, he's already in the tractor. He's very friendly, very outgoing, very ready to do any task that you ask him to do. He's a great asset to Pinellas County. He's very professional, um, always high energy, but positivity is number one. Um, it's infectious, like you can see if someone's having a bad day in the park and they interact with Tony, afterwards they're gonna be smiling. I love it. Every day it's always something different. You never know what, one minute you could be doing one thing and next minute you're on a rescue mission. You never know. I was pretty much doing my typical day at, at Brooker Creek that morning. I came down and I was fueling the truck and we had a patron, husband and wife, come into the maintenance area and they said that there's a man in distress out on the lake. It was pretty stormy out in the distance and it, the lightning and stuff was moving in so we were trying to act and react quickly. In the situation when we got out here, the man was yelling, and Tony immediately went over the boardwalk, handed me his phone, said, keep yelling, but let me know where you are. So I swam out to him, told him my name's Tony, I'm a park ranger here, and uh, you know, I'm gonna help you out today. And he was very happy. And I grabbed a rope off of his boat and just started swimming until I could touch the bottom, and Jeremy was my eyes and ears. I kept shouting out, Jeremy, where are you at? Where are you at? He was, I'm over here, I'm over here. So I was listening for his voice. And uh, he guided me over to this picnic pavilion. Sean brought me a first aid kit over to me and I was able to take care of that. And uh, the three of us pretty much got him up and over this railing to safety before the storm hit. So that was very rewarding. It was inspiring. And to a point it was like another day with Tony. It just happened to involve someone's life. We not only take care of the parks, but we ensure the safety and security of our park visitors. That means if we are the first staff on scene, we do whatever was, is within our power to uh, help the situation. Wow, um, what a guy. I mean, that's one of the most selfless things I've been around. It's not normal, it's, uh, 
he went above and beyond. It was very heroic, and uh, we're proud of him. I'm Tony Contarino, and I am Pinellas County. Well, I think the video speaks volumes, you know, and, uh, you know, and so I, I will tell you, I would trade my office for your office every single day because what, what a place to work. But it's part of your dedication, you know, and, and I know you love it, and that shows in your work. Um, but it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work. Um, and, and I know you, everybody goes out of their way to make our park system just the best for people. And, it, and, and the, the, the public comments on that so often about how, and that's, it, it's not in great shape without your efforts. But it's also far more than that, just like you did in that response. It's taking care of people and helping them out. So for everything that you do and for the entire team, we just want to thank you thank and uh, congratulations. Thank you so much. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you. I just want to thank you. Um, it feels really good to be here. I'm honored. Uh, that rescue was a little over two months ago, and it made me feel so good that I was able to do that. I'm still smiling. <laughs> but that's one of the reasons why I love being a park ranger is just to help people every day. You know, I have a passion for helping people, and it just made me feel good. I've, I've been with the county uh, almost 33 years, and uh, I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> I've got several more years that I want to do, you know, for the citizens of Pinellas County. So, um, but I want to thank uh, my supervisor and Jolanda for nominating me for this. I'm truly honored, thank you so much. And I want to thank Jeremy Bayless and Sean Kuzmak uh, for assisting me on the lake that day. You know, they were a tremendous help. And um, together we took customer service to the next level. I mean, <laughs> truly. And I want to thank the communications team, the Pinellas County communications team it was so nice working with those guys. They're true professionals. You know, Brian, Andy, and Tony, uh, talented individuals. And uh, keep up the great work, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, take the time to do something kind every day. We all need it. All right? Thank you. Our next item, we'd like uh, pleased to welcome Anne Marie Flannery, AARP Florida Associate State Director for Community Outreach, as well as Tim Burns, Director of Programs with Human Service, has come forward. Five years ago, Pinellas County joined AARP's network of age-friendly communities. Age-friendly communities are designed to consider what makes a community a great place for people of all ages and abilities to live, work, play, and thrive. Departments under the county administrator identified a champion who worked with their team to develop a plan for their department. The result was an impressive plan that's been recognized nationally by AARP for our unique approach. We're pleased today to announce that Human Services Department received the AARP National Network Age-Friendly Award. And developing the next five-year plan will begin soon. We look forward to the next phase of our age-friendly Pinellas journey. And I'd like to recognize um, Tim Burns, Director of our Programs, for a few words. Hi, um, Tim Burns, Director of Programs for Pinellas County Human Services. Uh, this has been a very collaborative effort, uh, a lot of partners around the community. Uh, there's been a lot of great effort uh, by the departments of <coughs> Pinellas County in putting together a five-year plan. Um, there have been a lot of good milestones, even throughout COVID, um, and a lot more to come. So we're really looking forward to the next five years. Ms. Lander, would you like to say something? Sure. Your word? Yeah, I guess I should turn this around now. Unveiling it. Um, on behalf of AARP Florida, I'm very pleased to be able to present this to Age Friendly Pinellas County for their continued work in making the county livable for people of all ages. So congratulations. 
your photo. We'll do a photo. And, and I want to recognize Commissioner Long. Uh, several years ago, she really uh, brought this as an important issue for the County Commission to focus on, and we're seeing some of that fruition today. Thank you. All right, next on our agenda is citizens to be heard. I'll call your name, call your name. Uh, come forward, introduce yourself. You'll have three minutes to address the board. We'll start with David Ballard Geddes, Jr. Hi, good afternoon, commissioners. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live at Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. As a contrived third party bond charge, I'm being forced to pay for the reclaimed water availability fee against my will. I have no desire to use reclaimed water, nor have I been given a choice to deny such charges. I have been given no base consumption use permit allowing my minimal use of my vital water needs before applying such third party toll charges. For example, my electric bill has a reasonable use base permit for electricity. Now, should I exceed that reasonable base allowance, then additional billing charges apply, and only <coughs> then are additional charges applied to discourage excessive usage, encouraging only basic needs of consumer use due to the strain on the electric grid. My water bill has no essential base water use allowance before ad hocing additional third party charges. In effect, my supply and rate delegated by the special acts of 1953 have been disregarded in light of the reclaimed water availability fee as a third party toll charge in which the electric, uh, in which <coughs> the reclaimed water availability fee in actuality delivers nothing based on statute 15311. The fee is in support of a direct third party bond charge, which in turn is in disrespect of my essential water supply and rate, which now my vital, my essential water is considered a privilege to access. As the electric company employs a basic use policy before ad hocing additional charges, <coughs> the water company must also employ a supply and rate basic use policy as to per capita consumer water usage as the water company <coughs> is in violation of delegated law based on the special acts of 1953. As my right to water has been violated, I am adamantly opposed to invoking any further ad hoc third party hedge fund compacts formulating capitalistic pursuits while continuing to deprecate the quality of our water supply. Furthermore, here is my response to <coughs> agenda here is my response to agenda item number twenty three and twenty four of june twenty first meeting last month. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Mac Johnson. Come forward. 
Introduce yourself. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Matt Johnson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I always uh, think of this time as a time when I can come and say a couple words just to encourage us a little bit. Uh, because I don't know about you, but I find a lot of people don't seem to be encouraged with this wonderful life. And it is so wonderful. <laughs> uh, in, 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 in the county, I want to encourage us because, again, uh, certainly, we, we're without a doubt at the top of the line, but we want to continue to be that way. And uh, having a proper foundation always bring that together. I want to say a few words here from uh, the Bible here, mainly uh, a verse that I got from Psalm 119, verse 89. And it says, your word is settled in heaven forever. Uh, what that means is God's word is, is, is true and it's settled. You're not going to change it. And here we are today, you know, we're going through a time where, <laughs> you know, looking at the time we're going through, and I hear some people try to explain what's happening with this COVID and all that stuff. Let me tell you what's happening with that. Actually, uh, uh, some people say it's the last time, the last days. What does that mean? the last time. A lot of people try to explain it, and they try to explain it from the Bible, but really when you study the scriptures, uh, God said when you think it's the last time, that's not going to be the time. So don't worry about the last time. What you worry about is your last time. This is, my, this is perhaps my last time I might get a chance to say anything to our county. I want to be sure every word is said in a way that it does something. Words are very important. So, I think of uh, the COVID as being kind of like a sign. It's almost like uh, if you study the Bible a little bit, you'll know there was a, a, a handwriting on the wall to this king that has taken and desecrated the things of God, like a lot of us have done today. <coughs> and, and that handwriting was saying, hey, man, your time is up. You know, you, you, you know it's too late for you. A lot of us are going to get that COVID thing, and it's going to be too late. But right now, we have the time to do something with who we are for God, for life. We can receive Christ. We can know the Bible is still forever. It's God's word. Study it, learn it, make it yours while you have a chance. Help this county to be the kind of <coughs> county that God would have it to be. And all that's going to take is us individually having that relationship with God through Christ and then studying this powerful word and learning how to walk it out in Jesus' name. Not religion. Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Greg Pound, come forward. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Greg Pound on Largo, Florida, Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell in the nation that forgets God. I just want to share with you a little experience I had at the Gay Pride Parade that I thought maybe you should be made aware of. Um, you know, the Bible, this Bible, as he said, things is not going to change. Either we change and line up to it. And one of the things it says to it, it says, sex outside of marriage breeds violence, and it turns the men into women and the women into men. Now, the reason we have such a high divorce rate and relationships gone bad is because people are not realizing you're not to have sex until marriage. You do, you're defiling your relationship. And then these children are brought up without fathers. Now, when I was down there, I mean, when someone jumps on you and, and starts hitting you, and, and one girl said, you know, the stuff they threw on me was red stuff. She said that was menstrual blood. And, um, you know, and then, and then you got people down there masturbating in public. And this is on our public streets downtown St. Pete. And I was just wondering if you think that this is, this is good for our county to have all these children around there. And um, I videotaped it. I got on videotape to show people this stuff so you can actually see it. I mean, if you want, I'll bring it in. If you let everyone in the county see it, just watch it and watch what happened. And, um, you know, I mean, if someone attacks you and starts beating you up and, and grabs your property, and all we're telling there and telling them that, listen, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. 
and that sex is not love. And then they're going to attack you for that? Because, and, and, but I, mean, if, I don't know if you guys study this Bible or not, but sex outside of marriage breeds violence. We have become a violent culture. We've got the biggest prison system in the world. We've got a society filled with violence. It's out of control, violence, corruption. Okay, and if we don't get back to this one moral principle so we can keep our families together, keep the father and the mother in the home so the children have parents, so this stuff can stop. Because all we're doing is destroying ourselves. And what's so, so sad, it was, I mean, I look down there, I mean, I'm just being honest with you. I mean, I, on the video, you can watch it, they're all white people. I mean, I don't know what happened to the white culture. I mean, I guess it's white privilege or what it is. It's made us think that we can do whatever we want. It's because we arrived, we've got all the money, you got all the food, you've got, you know, like, and everybody wants to come to America. Free sex, free education, free money, um, free abortion. I mean, everything's free. So, who, I mean, who's not, who's not going to want to come to a place where everything's free? All the food you can eat, all the sex you want, all the abortions you want. Um, it's just, it's a big free-for-all. So, all I want to do is encourage you, if we don't repent as a nation, as a people, I mean, I mean, if you don't see it, I mean, just look at our leaders. I mean, I watched the news with Biden and his son and doing cocaine and running prostitution and his father saying, I'll protect your son. He says it right in there, and they played the recording, and these guys are running our country. They're running it right in the ground. And God's going to judge America. We're not going to get away with this, folks. Next is Karen uh, Tubergen. Come forward, introduce yourself. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Tubergen. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me. <laughs> well, maybe you're not. No. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for allowing me the time to express my concerns in regards to the Lakeshore Neighborhood Road Improvement Project that's happening in Palm Harbor, Florida. When this project started years ago, we were told that our street, Lakeshore Drive, would no longer have ditches. I was so excited for my neighbors. I do not have any ditches, and I'm hoping that it stays that way. We were told that our street would have gutters along the side of the road to allow the water to flow smoothly down the street. However, now that the work has begun on our specific street, we have learned that we were not told the correct information years ago. Um, our biggest thing is safety concerns with these ditches. Children and animals. We have large pipes now in these ditches. They are so large that a child or a small animal, they could literally be swept right into these pipes that are running through these ditches. Our street is a very narrow street, and when cars travel down our street, they literally have to slow down when passing another vehicle because you can't, it's so narrow. Um, pedestrians are at a risk when vehicles are traveling down our road. I was told years ago that we could not get speed bumps on this street because it was the main street into the neighborhood. Cars travel down this road rather quickly. Pedestrians need to get off the road quick when a vehicle is coming, and now with these large ditches, it makes it more difficult. Our road is already narrow to begin with, as I said. Lakeshore Drive is only 18 feet wide and most roads are at least 21 feet wide. There are no sidewalks on our street, so pedestrians are forced to use the road. When homeowners have guessed, there are times when people need to park on the side of the road. Now they really can't do that with these ditches. There are some driveways that literally have the ditch right next to them, which makes it very difficult to get in and out of these cars. My stepfather is a veteran who is going to be turning 80 next year. He will not be able to keep up with the grass in these ditches. They're so steep. The ditches uh, make it very difficult to cut, especially for the elderly. I spoke with Mrs. Rhonda Bowman. She came out and met with me and discussed my concerns and recommended that he either try to maintain it on his own or hire somebody to cut it. Um, I just feel that it's very <coughs> unsafe. Right now, the areas are already taped off because they're unsafe. So once they lay grass, they're going to take the tape off. I don't know how that makes a difference. Um, again, no sidewalks on this narrow road. Forces everybody to travel on the road only, bikes, everything. Um, when garbage trucks are coming down, any large trucks, we're forced to move over quickly. It just makes it very dangerous. So the teacher and me says that when you have a problem, follow it with a solution. So a way to fix it is we thought, like, obviously to get rid of the ditches. The, um, there's permeable piping. That's an option that they could use. Um, I just feel like there's got to be something else. I know that this project is almost coming near its end, but we're really hoping that you can help make it right. I appreciate that you started this meeting with a prayer, and through 
This whole process, we've been praying for this to be fixed and for the safety of the children. Thank you. Next is Erica Helm. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Erica Helm. I keep it short and sweet. Um, I'm also speaking on the subject of the large excessive ditches in our neighborhood. Um, I've been a homeowner for 11 plus years at Lakeshore Drive. There's pretty there's several um, concerns of mine as a parent. I'm sorry, I talk a little bit low. Um, my name's Erica Helm. I'm an owner at Lakeshore Drive. I've been an owner there for 11 plus years. There's a lot of concerns about the large excessive ditches. If either of you would visit, you would immediately see the concerns. The main concern is it's a <coughs> huge um, decline of the home of our depreciation of our home. Um, the, de the ditches are large, they're excessive. It's a breeding ground for mosquitoes and snakes very dangerous to our children at play, very dangerous to our pets at play. If you see the piping, as Karen shared with you, there's literally piping and there's holes um, before we had the construction done. And I'm grateful for your services and we are grateful to the Board of County Commissioners and Pinellas County Utility. But if it's a problem, we would like to fix it before we get to the point where we cannot reverse the problem. Um, before, before this started, even before there was a breeding ground for mosquitoes. Now the ditches are larger. Something happened about four years ago where my mother-in-law literally drove in the ditch and the car was flip side up. Karen herself had to take her truck and pull the ditch. Thank God, you know, she was able to be okay and hospitalized, but <coughs> the ditches are larger and only gonna cause more concern and issues. We have a lot of veterans that live in our neighborhood that are on fixed income and with the inflation of 9% at this point, a lot of them do live off of fixed income. One of my neighbors was told by one of the engineers when he voiced the concern, you know, how am I expect to cut this? He was told, hire someone. To me, as a member and someone who have served in our service, services, to me that's unacceptable. I don't think that anyone should be allowed to be talked like that, and especially someone who have fought for the country for you and I. So, you know, just if you can go out there, take a look. There's so many concerns, but the main thing is to have the safety of our family men members, our kids, our veterans. We have a lot of elderly <coughs> people that live in this neighborhood. Being realistic with the cost of rise of living, it's impossible for them to cut it. And I just want to ask, you know, anyone here, if you were to live in our neighborhood, you know, would you be okay with this eyesore with a huge, excessive, large ditch in front of your home? So that's my ask. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dillon, I understand you did not want to speak. Is that correct? All right. Thank you. Uh, George Douglas. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Uh, I live in the same neighborhood as uh, Eric and uh, Karen. Uh, same complaints and concerns about safety. Uh, my house happens to be one of the higher houses in the neighborhood. When they put these DBI boxes, uh, ditch bottom inlet boxes, they're 18 inches below the street. My house is three foot above the street, and now I have a slope that goes down almost 50 degrees. There's just absolutely no way to mow this, and it's just unsafe. And pretty much all the other things that uh, the <coughs> other guys have been talking about. Okay. That's pretty all much right. it. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. I wanted to let the uh, members speak, and then we'll get uh, some staff reaction. Uh, Jason Trojaner. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking the time to listen to us. Uh, my name is Jason Trojaner. I live at 27 Lakeshore Drive. And, um, Previously, many people have, I'm here to discuss the, those same ditches. Previously, um, many people in the neighborhood had uh, these ditches that they installed uh, drainage through the middle and covered. So um, I, I unfortunately didn't. So, um, so I'm, I'm used to living with large ditches on either side of my driveway, my single car driveway. 
And, um, but, and I didn't think it could possibly get any worse. I thought, any improvement to our road, this is a road improvement project, I'm going to be thrilled, you know. They, they came back, and initially they had put um, a uh, relatively a very steep, at the, the DBI box that um, George mentioned, uh, relatively steep, but maybe six foot wide uh, hole in, in my front yard. And uh, just last Thursday, they came in and uh, plowed the whole, whole way from, from my neighbor's driveway to the right to my neighbor's driveway on the left. I have a giant ditch uh, many times steeper than it was previously. And uh, this, this past weekend, I was out weed whacking, totally aware of the ditch. Uh, I have a blueberry bush in a pot, and I'm just weed whacking behind, and I stepped into the ditch. I did not fall and hurt myself. I'm pretty capable, you know, relatively young, but, uh, uh, you know, it was definitely a concern. I could see how someone, you know, of age or, you know, uh, just a little bit less uh, um, agile would, would fall in. So that was a real concern. Um, see, I, did, I didn't really plan on speaking today, but uh, I do have a few notes. So there's already <coughs> drainage. These, these, there is drainage. There's piping through, through my yard, yet now there's a, it's literally chest high. I would say it's uh, four foot deep because I'm also on a hill like George. And the, it's only 18 inches off the road, but we're already sloping down. So it's a very steep uh, ditch when you drop off to get to the bottom of this box, which is 18 inches below the road. So, um, so those are very, very real concerns. Um, let's see. I mean, my, my question is, if I would have had a double driveway, um, I, don't, I think they would have stopped at my driveway. Is that, is that all that room really necessary to take up? Do they really need my entire front yard? Because I have drainage on one side, and I have drainage on the other side of my driveway. I have two, two DBI boxes on either side of my driveway. Um, is all that space really necessary? And I know that these, I, don't, I just don't feel like this was well planned out, because, um, because right now, my neighbor had a, a graded ditch coming down to the, to the left side of my driveway, and they're currently filling it back in. So I feel like planning was inadequate. I don't think they, uh, they planned for the this deepness of our, um, of our yards. It's took into consideration, and I'm very disappointed in the outcome. And it's definitely an eyesore and a concern of safety. So appreciate you looking into it. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Steven Pitzer? OK, thank you, Mr. Pitzer. Uh, Mr. Burton. I vaguely remember us having a discussion on this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yes, this project started a couple of years ago. Um, to the neighbor's concerns, I have been out personally and walked out with our project manager. And while Kelly's walking up, I'll give you a, a little background because she's going to fill in the details. Um, this project was started as a replacement in kind. So it was a uh, replacement of a, of a street that we had taken over. Um, and we found a lot of challenges uh, with that, having not been up to county standards when it was originally built. But what it did not do is expand the scope. In other words, it doesn't have a, a proper retention for covering and having areas to drain to. And, and all the things that you have to go through through a SWIFMA permit in order to be able to do this. So some of the requested changes, I understand, but it would, it would cause to completely redesign the project. And especially as we got towards the end, the contract was let based upon design standards. And so there was really no way of modifying that without gathering, taking out the community park and making that a stormwater area or something like that to change that. So we were, we were you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, we started down a path with a replacement in kind for that neighborhood. Um, and so there's been concerns, and staff has taken those concerns seriously. They have, I have personally, I went out and walked with our, with our project manager of that, trying to understand the, the inlets. Commissioner Eggers has, you know, discussed this with staff several times, trying to find solutions. So I'll let Kelly just kind of talk through that. But from a higher level, not in, to, I'm not an engineer, um, and, I'll, and I'll let her speak to those specific issues. Um, there has been challenges. Be, in part because that's the way we were designing the project, and um, and that's where we're at now. Um, the contract is let. Any changes to that, frankly, for a permit would stop the project, and you would, and then you have all the cost of stopping, mobilizing, and restarting the project. So, um, Kelly, I'll, maybe you can fill in on some of the details because you've been out there also. Okay, uh, Kelly Hammerlevy, Public Works Director, and if I could get the overhead projector, please. I just want to uh, lay down some. A uh, little background because, uh, you know, this project was actually designed and permitted before my time. So I wanted to dive in a little bit and understand 
what were we trying to achieve here? So I'm just going to lay down some pictures. These are actually from the preliminary engineering report. And it actually came out from, you know, citizens' concerns about drainage on the roadways as well as pavement condition. I'm just going to kind of go through. These are, you know, pictures taken as part of that preliminary engineering study of standing water on all the roads in the neighborhood, a lot of the roads in the neighborhood. Um, even, uh, you know, si pretty, pretty significant uh, flooding, even even water right up to a home. Obviously, when you have significant water standing on roads, you then start to have pavement failure. And as we learned during the, um, when we came here for the change order, it was because of the roadway base um, that was failing. This bottom picture, I just want to note that you see the, the pavement there, the roadway, and a berm, and then that's, that's the lake. It's a canal right there on the other side. So we don't have a lot of elevation change between this neighborhood and Lake Tarpon, which makes drainage challenging. And again, just another, another picture of, of the pavement condition, which was another um, issue that the neighborhood brought up. So this, this project was, was designed in, you know, to address both issues. One, the fact that the pavement was failing and we had an unsafe roadway condition and the fact that we had travel lanes filled with water, again, making an unsafe roadway condition. So, I mean, I have, I listened to, you know, all of our residents here and I was out there myself um, a little over a week ago um, looking at the issues, asking, you know, what we could do to mitigate, you know, some of the challenges. Um, every, every property is a little bit different. Um, you know, Mr. Mr. Douglas is absolutely correct. Um, when the final road is in, right now the road is not in, so you're standing on bare dirt. So for me, being out there, it was actually a little challenging because there is no road, so I'm sitting here going 18 inches. It doesn't look like 18 inches to me. Well, guess what? No, the, the road base is not there. The asphalt's not there. So <laughs> it is a little deceiving in that way. Um, we are going to work as much as we can with each of the property owners to grade and create a safe, a safe slope for mowing. I mean, I'm sorry if somebody said, you know, go hire somebody. I, I do not know who said that. That, was, that would be completely inappropriate um, to do and, and that we will continue to work with each resident. Um, but where, where open conveyances exist, we, as Barry said, we are required to keep them. If we were to, um, you know, one of, the one of the recommendations was we'll just pipe them, you know, uh, pipe them all. Well, if we did that, we'd have to compensate for the storage, for the additional storm water that's not, that can't be stored in those pipes, um, and water treatment before it goes into Lake Tarpon. So we're <coughs> talking about acquiring property, building a stormwater pond um, to, meet that, to meet that objective. So we, we could not find a path forward there. Um, there's been comments about perforated pipes and allowing it to filter. Well, um, we're, we've, we're to, I mentioned how close we are to the lake. We have a very high groundwater table in this area, as well as the soil conditions just are not conducive to perforated pipes in this area. Um, this is a very, very challenging project. I, you know, I know the community has, has been very distressed about the length of time it's taken to construct it as well as the improvements that have been made. But We'll continue to work with them as much as we can to ameliorate as much of the issues as we can, but we can't el eliminate the open conveyances in the neighborhood. Commissioner Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Kelly, thank you for that explanation. So my question is, you heard the residents talk about the pipes that were there. Mm -hmm. Is there any plan to cover those pipes at all? Were they just going to be pipes in a ditch, and then you where there was an existing ditch, there's an existing, there's still a ditch. That was part of the permitting. We got an exemption, so it's like for like. So if there was an open ditch there, there's still an open ditch. Or the pipe going through it. I would just like to point out there is piping underneath <coughs> the ditches. I'm sorry. But uh, so, but how is that not a public safety issue? <laughs> Again, it's the open conveyances were there pre-existing. Um, before the community, I mean, commissioners, we, it's, it's we have open kind of conveyances. We have them everywhere. A, a lot, <laughs> we have a open conveyance ditches on a lot of our roads yeah. throughout the county. So you have that's, open that's conveyance, and then you have a pipe underneath the driveway. I get that. Typically, in some yeah. of these areas. And where there's there's some areas where like in between um, properties, I can actually I have some pictures actually. Um, Let's see where like here's a here's a picture of you know there's a pipe and then there's kind of a hole and then there's a pipe and in that in that area 
um, you know, there's a, a ditch bottom inlet going in there. So this will be graded out, um, sod will be brought in. Again, you can see over here, there's no road yet. Um, but basically, instead of having open pipes, um, there'll be a ditch bottom inlet and the water will flow in and then out. Um, so that's just an example of where we had pipes and it was replaced with a ditch bottom inlet. Commissioner Flowers? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So from the photo you just, can you put that photo back up? Sure. So are we um, only servicing the right of way that belongs to us or are we actually intruding in on their property line? No, we're, we're working within the right of way. Within the right of way. And so um, even because it looks like some of his sod um, was taken up and we're going to replace that, I guess, as a result of the work experience. So all of all of where the dirt is between these orange barrel thingamabobbies or whatever, um, are we sodding all the way down to there? It, will there be... Yes. Sidewalks along there and then the curb before no the sidewalks. street or what are you going to do? Yeah. No, no sidewalks. It's, um, yeah, it'll, the, the marker right here, that's a survey marker, the right-of-way line. So it'll be sodded um, right up to the asphalt um, and then the road. There's okay. no sidewalks on this, the, on this, on this road. Okay. And so for the, the picture prior to this where it was piping a hole and then piping, so the intended purpose is that the water comes from <coughs> the pipe and just kind of pools and settles there. Why would you no, not have a No, there's a there's a 15 inch pipe underground. Okay. Um. So I'll just uh, some perspective on you know what those pipes look like. Um. You know here's what they look like. So um, they're in very poor condition. We pulled them out. We, all of the pipes in the neighborhood are 15 inch. So okay. that's 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 the size. Um, we pulled them out, they're replaced with 15 inch pipes. So as that water goes into the dish bottom inlet, then it'll flow uh, through the pipes. Okay. And um, I, I do agree, I see those open ditches, I mean, anywhere you, you drive, I've seen them quite frequently in a lot of neighborhoods. And sometimes when there's really heavy rain, um, they, they will fill and overflow. The pictures that you showed us of the flooding, is that or do you know if that is after a heavy rain or just a moderate rain and it's just tremendous flooding in this area much like it is in Gulfport and some of our other low-lying areas well this was one this was one of the main purposes of the project so it was a chronic problem is that is that the open conveyance system and the pipes were undersized to begin with okay. so the system was really not capable of handling the rainfall we receive and the new pipes they've been sized to accommodate you know the storms that we receive and to keep the water within the drainage system and keep it off the road <coughs> so that we have safe passage do you have any pictures that would show us um what they were talking about as it relates to the depth of the the ditch the drop off yeah um i don't know that i I brought any, I just... Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask that y'all not do yeah. that. Someone has said something to you all consistently. No one interrupted you when you were speaking, so please do not do that. You've had your time, and we're asking questions. I'm sorry, okay. Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, let me just pull up. Um, okay, so, um, you know, for example, this is Mr. Douglas's home. And you can see there was a, a pre-established ditch with pipe underneath his driveway. Mm -hmm. And um, the initial concern that the project manager relayed um, was that he needed to be able to safely, um, he has a, a boat that he keeps back here and needed to be able to safely man, move in and out of here. Um, so this is a picture from today. Um, the ditch bottom inlet's been installed. It's, there's no final grading here. Mm -hmm. um, so as best we can, the, as far as how close this edge is to his driveway, it will be the same to ensure, you know, that he can back in and back out um, safely. Again, this is just open. It hasn't been, there's no final grading or anything at this point in time. But there are, I've been out there, you know, the, the, the drainage system in some areas is, is very wide. And we've been talking to the design professional about how we can shallow up some of those slopes so that people can mow and, and be safe. Um, okay. But again, at the same time, we're trying to, uh, this is a very complicated project, trying to 
keep the water off the roads, trying to keep water out of people's houses, um, trying to keep the community safe. We've got narrow road, narrow roadway and a confined area to work, work in. And if we had to take all this water and put it in a pond, then we would have had to acquire probably somebody's house or the community area down by the lake where they have their boat launch. Um, we try as much as possible to work within the right of way and, and preserve people's property. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chief. Commissioner Long? I, I have one more question, Kelly. At what point will this project be finished, do you know? We're scheduled to be done in November. This November? Correct. Well, at least that's a final. Yeah, for the commissioners, <coughs> the, they've been doing it in sections, and so this is the last section of um, the subdivision. We do have to, so um, like Maple Street, um, which is the road immediately adjacent, is, is done with the exception of the last lift of asphalt. So where we've finished the drainage improvements, we've got one lift of asphalt down, but we'll, once all of that's done, we'll come in and do that final lift of asphalt at the very end so that the neighborhood is all all cleaned up and ready to go. Um, but again, we, we will continue to work with each property owner, you know, to do our best to ensure as much as possible that we're creating a safe condition and modifying where we can. Commissioner Eggers. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and um, I think <laughs> I, I went out there, I don't know, four years ago, uh, three years ago, two years ago, different sections of this project. Up this street all the way back to 19, um, it has a, a myriad of different um, solutions. They have underground piping where it's covered over with grass. Um, across the street, uh, and I'm not sure if I was looking there at the end at the south side or the north side of the road because I didn't know which side you were taking. Well, the south side is high and the north side <coughs> is low. So, so you were, those pictures are from the north side? Different, different. Mr. Uh, Mr. Douglas is on the south side. South side. Okay, and there are there are other there's again the total length of this street, um, the part that we're talking about here is very small part of that whole street. It just seems to me if there was an effort or an, and, and a real interest in upgrading not only the safety. I think this this is a unique property area as you mm -hmm. said, narrow roads, no sidewalks. Mm -hmm. It's a main drag, getting into the community, and I think we owed it to everybody to come up with a solution that gets rid of those ditches. Those ditches are not, I mean, again, I'm not saying we don't have them, but in this community and this location, I just think they're unacceptable completely. And I never really understood quite why we, you know, we're dictated by swift mud, and yet there's other issues at play too. Um, and I do understand the concerns about people's safety. You know, you just take a tumble down that that hill, and, and it's not going to be a pleasant outcome. I didn't hadn't heard about the car in the ditch or mm -hmm. all of that stuff. It is just, um, it's really just unfortunate. And we and we spent so much money fixing up that neighborhood on the road part. What a nice thing to be able to add to their values of their properties. And I'm not talking about, you know, we're talk, talking <coughs> about big money, but just ta not taking away from the values. The ditches, in my mind, on that street are just unacceptable. And I, I just can't imagine there wasn't another solution that in, maybe it did involve a community conversation about a park, maybe some land that we have to take put into a, um, a retention pond or something. But I, I mean, I think that community discussion could have been had. And that's a choice, maybe. They decide we're not going to we're going to keep the ditches, for crying out loud, and not have the park affected, or the, the reverse. But I just think that's just, it's just a shame how much, how much time and energy and money went into fixing that neighborhood up. And a little part, and I call it the little part of the entire project that's left there, uh, could have been done, I think, a much better job on it. Just my comments. And I've been out there a few times, so thank you. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, I... Uh... <laughs> I can assure people that there are ditches like this all over the county. If you go drive down Indian Rocks Road, where there is a lot of traffic and no sidewalks on a good part <coughs> of it, those ditches are at least four feet deep, they, probably more than that in some places. Um, Wilcox is the same way. You have some pretty deep ditches there, and there's no way you could actually mow those ditches. Um, did you say that there was a park there? that they chose not to use that for drainage or that we chose not to 
Um, I don't could know. Be it was if never designed. Any... It was well, never I designed. That. With, yeah. with, with I don't that know if mind. there were any conversations. I'll be honest. There's oh, okay. all the way down at the lake. They have a boat. They have a boat launch and mm -hmm. a community building um, there at the very end. I mean, street. I know that there's a lot of work that's gone into this, and I've been hearing about flooding from Lake Tarpon for heaven knows how many years now. And I've been trying to get sidewalks on Indiana Rocks Road for 20 years at least. We're working on that. <laughs> I, know, I know. I know it's on the agenda. Um, but I dare say we're still going to have ditches. You know, it is what it is. We live in a very low water table county, and you have to have a way to get rid of that. You have to have a way to contain the water while it trickles down. And that's yeah, this, true this is, all over the county. Yeah, their neighborhood is very flat. It's it's very challenging. Um, well, like I said, I was out there, happen. and you know, I I feel for everything that is going on with this project and the people involved. It's right. it's difficult, very difficult. Well, I appreciate the efforts that you're going to be able to do to ameliorate some of it. Obviously, not all, but. I would just say that as we move forward on other projects around the county, just because we have them doesn't make this okay, and that we continue to look for solutions that are a little bit more in line. You're talking about <coughs> Indian Rock Road and bringing sidewalks in and the like, and again, I think that's the point. The safety issues of falling in, the safety issues of the roads. Um, I know there's a, com a couple of communities over in Dunedin that we walk around, there's no sidewalks in there, but I, I haven't seen a ditch yet. And so there's, there's plenty, of, everybody knows to drive s slowly through the streets and no ditches to fall into, no sidewalks to walk on. But I just think each community is unique and different and needs to be looked at that way. So uh, I hope that the excuse of, well, we have them all over the place is not the one we use when we look at these projects individually. Thank you. Commissioner Duran. <coughs> Commissioner Eggers, I don't think it's an excuse. I think it's a reality. This is where we live. You know, we had, you can't pipe all the water out to the bay or to Lake Tarpon or or to the Gulf of Mexico. You just can't. There has to be a way to direct it. I, I don't, I mean, there's never going to be completely piped stormwater, believe me. I mean, I think we heard that. I'd love to hear that presentation in full. You know, take all day if you need to because that it's unrealistic to think we're never going to have ditches. I didn't say not, that. Uh, well, I didn't say that. Eighty percent of this road is di it does not have ditches. Maybe even more than that. And it is a slight downhill grade to the to the lake. So th there had been a solution to what whatever that solution I is. A lot of flooding. You know, that, or was. that was but yeah, it was. That's right. Not it, before the streets were taking into account. All, all I'm saying is is that this this was ninety percent taken care of and there's just an incremental piece that needed to be also taken care of and, um, and again I'm not I'm not saying we're not gonna have ditches in some places I'm just saying don't use that as a reason not to pursue a solution so all right thank you very much for being with us today uh, we've heard your concerns um, we'll look forward to hearing more I think the safety uh, of the residents on the incline as we regrade the properties is, is paramount that's the number one thing um, sounds like we uh, wish we could go back and look, be at the beginning of this project when we could have evaluated maybe some other options, but um, we'll have to see where we are in the grading. But we'll continue to monitor it, and please stay in touch with us uh, as we move forward. Thank you for being here today. Mr. Chair, um, is there, can we have mosquito control or something go out there since that also was an issue? We've had yeah, some absolutely. pretty rainy days, and at least... Yeah, we can absolutely have mosquito control come out. Okay. Thanks. I know. I had a question, too, that I forgot. Um, somebody mentioned that at the open pipes are a danger to kids and <coughs> small dogs and don't we have a grate or something over so that large objects can't have, get in there I have to defer to Kelly on I know I forgot uh, while um, she was standing there it's also a maintenance issue on yeah <laughs> I know um, I, I know it clogs things up but in the yards what one would call a DBI a ditch bottom inlet yes they have grates over them okay. but on either side of um, some driveway. of the some of the driveways we have a kind of like a mitered in section and it's a it's a it's a pipe, but it's it's 15 inches. It's 15 inches. It's not, you know, huge. That's 15 not, inches yeah. is a right. minimum pipe size in the road. Commissioner Seal. Uh, Kelly um, and <clears throat> group. Um, as I recall, we had an extensive discussion about this at a work session. Am I not correct? Yeah. And you went over 
all the reasons why we could do some of the stuff that we could do and not do. And, and a lot of it had to do, I know, with moving the water and the depth and the height of the neighborhood and the streets and everything else like that. So um, <clears throat> I <clears throat> agree with Commissioner Justice that if you can, you know, help with the incline and, you know, but honestly, having those grates there is a great improvement over having the pipes. It's yeah. going to be, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's much more attractive. I'm, I'm actually quite pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I think, I mean, it is really hard to envision anything right now. It, it looks like, well, I'm going to be honest, it looks like a war zone. You go right. out there, the road's gone. It just, yeah, I mean, it's it's construction everywhere. Uh -huh. and, and I and I understand their, their fatigue over that, that issue alone. Um, but but I know that you all yeah. tried to make some adjustments and tried to mm -hmm. do some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. We're, we will continue to work with the residents. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. Uh, I have no other citizens to be heard. We're next on our agenda is our consent agenda. Is there anything to be pulled? Move consent, Mr. Chair. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Long, second from Commissioner Eggers on the consent agenda. We'll take a voice vote on the consent. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So it passes unanimously. Moving on to our regular agenda, item number 18. Good afternoon, Mr. Administrator. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, item number 18 is a change order number one to an agreement with Creative Contractors for the design build quartz consolidation project. When they originally <coughs> designed this, they had envisioned uh, tying in the existing fire alarm system. That was not possible, and so this modifies uh, that by $877,000 to put in a new fire alarm system. And that was a change on our part? That was a change on our, well, it didn't work, so we had to put in a new system. Questions? Discussion? Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Flower, second from Commissioner Long. Question from Commissioner Seal. Uh, yes, I just was wondering how old the technology was. I mean, it states that. Oh, here comes Joe. There we go. Hi, Commissioner. Hi, Joe, Hi. Joe okay. Laurel with Administrative Services. This, pro this project was originally programmed about six years ago. And that was the original alarm system in that building. That building it was, was the original oh, yeah. alarm. Okay, that's all I needed yeah. to know. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Move approval. We got a, approval. We have a motion and a second. Yeah, right. That's okay. Right. We have a motion and a second. <coughs> the clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. It passes 6 0. And that brings me to point Commissioner uh, Peters is out today. I apologize for not bringing that up earlier. <laughs> Item number 19. This is a Fourth Amendment to the, okay, this is a, um, we're bringing this back. This is a Fourth Amendment to the Economic Development Funding Agreement with StarTech, and this is for them to stay in the existing location until the new incubator is done. Um, and they simply had an incorrect amount in that, and so this modifies the amount. Okay. Questions, discussion, or motion? <coughs> Move approval. Second. Motion from Commissioner Gerard, second from Commissioner Long. The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes 6 0. Thank you. <laughs> Item number 20. It's a historic pre preservation ad valorem tax exemption for two recently rehabilitated uh, historic properties located <clears throat> in the city of St. Petersburg. And they're listed in your packet. Move approval. Second. Motion from <coughs> Commissioner Long, second from Commissioner Gerard. Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes unanimously. Item number 21. This item is a resolution certifying that the housing projects construction, constructed by Habitat or <coughs> community are consistent with local plans. Uh, this requirement is per Florida statutes and requires local governments to pass a resolution certifying that, in fact, they were built according to local plans. So. Wow. <laughs> Have we had to do that before? Move approval. Is this yeah. something new or did <laughs> Have we done that before? Bruce? <laughs> I would have to ask Bruce. Uh -huh. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Bruce Bussey, Housing and Community Development. I don't think we've done this before. As my as I understand, it's a remember. change in state law. Oh. Habitat for Humanity has been receiving these donations and getting the tax credit before. <coughs> it's been a recent change that the local government needed to make this <laughs> finding that it's consistent with their plans. I do have okay. Sean King is here with Habitat for Humanity. I'd be able to add a little bit more to that, but this is the first time <laughs> that I'm right. aware of it. 
right. barred by statute. <laughs> All right, further questions? I believe we had a motion from Commissioner Flowers, second by Commissioner Long. Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes unanimously. Item 22. Item 22 is an interlocal agreement between us and the City of St. Petersburg for support of the <coughs> Inner City Cross Bay Ferry. Uh, as you recall, at the <coughs> we entered into the agreement um, last year. We asked for, we um, gave our notice of termination of the agreement and wished to enter into renegotiate terms of the agreement. Um, we met with the funding partners. However, mainly over across the bay, they were really concerned about reopening the agreement because of their South Tampa access issues um, and some grants that they had applied for. So the partners, in essence, said you contribute a lesser amount and they'll pick up the difference, but they weren't willing to re renegotiate the terms. So we bring this for you to, for your consideration. Commissioner Long. Uh, yes, I would like to thank Jill for doing her due diligence and going back and asking the questions about the electrification of the engines and the boats and I was very pleased I think I read it right Jill please correct me if I'm wrong to know that they are intending to pursue the federal grants available to move forward with that technology and take advantage of it as soon as they can is that correct please say yes yes commissioner that's correct <laughs> what, I, what I do want to share with you if it wasn't clear and what I sent you yesterday is that this actually was proposed by the city of St. Petersburg mm -hmm. uh, in response to your conversation and the concern. So I just wanted to make sure the commission was aware that they're watching and they're being very, very responsive. And can I just ask yes, a couple of other points for clarification so that we're all aware? My understanding is this is for three years <clears throat> or four? This is three. Three. And then, and does that mean, any, is there any time in the interim that we could potentially go back to the table or no? No, not on this because actually this is an interlocal between us and St. Petersburg. This pulls us out of the intergovernmental um, agreement between St. Petersburg, Tampa, and Hillsborough. And remember, Tam or Hillsborough County is the lead agency on that. Right. So yes. we. They don't let us forget it. <coughs> so. Thank you. Right. Further questions? Mr. Chair. Mr. Flowers. Jill, um, one portion of that does share that um, should the ferry dissolve or they're not providing service any longer, we would be refunded um, based on a pro rata share for the time that's remaining. Is there, was there language about a time frame by which we would be notified of any such decisions? There is not, um, but I, there is in the agreement. I, we don't have concerns based upon our communication with the city of St. Petersburg, but there is not a provision that I recall. It's just nice to know rather than read it in the newspaper. Sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. Amen. Uh, further Good questions? Point. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, is, there, is, there a, is there a sense that after this three-year term that there will be no additional requests for taxpayer dollars? No, sir. Um, part of that is no, we don't know, right? We don't know yet, but part of that is based upon conversations we've had over the last six months i wouldn't expect that you would see the you know it go to zero uh subsidy in year four again i think for we talked about this from the very beginning for transit oriented issues and transit oriented uses that presents one alternative when you start mm -hmm. talking about what's being used for now it's just different so yeah. and that doesn't right. seem to be changing in right. any time in the near future Thank you. Further questions? Discussion? A motion? Move we'll approval. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Long, second from Commissioner Flowers. The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. <coughs> Passes five to one. Item 23. This is a second resolution determining the necessity to construct um, bridge and drainage improvements uh, to um, Beckett Bridge and Riverside Drive. Um, this is what this does is reduce the size, but it adds additional details and corrects some things like tree locations and things like that from a previous res resolution uh, that you passed. Questions, discussion, or motion? <coughs> Move approval, Mr. Chair. Uh, second, but I have a question. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Gerard. Commissioner Gerard. I just wondered have we heard from people along this street here? 
that they have a big issue with the uh, rights away property We're rights. in communications now I mean, um, starting the appraisal process, so we'll be in touch with each. There have been some preliminary conversations. Kelly's staff has, has obviously been out, has met with those adjacent property owners, and, um, you know, I think, I think we're talking about some relatively small areas. We're optimistic that we won't need this tool, uh, but we're required to do the resolution in, for the funding and the permitting. There were some major issues with some of the areas originally. They worked most oh, yeah. of those out, yeah. okay, and they're largely resolved around the trailer, uh, uh, yeah. the mobile home park. Um, um, and again, most of those issues have come into play. Now it'll be an issue of what the property and value of, of that is worth and yeah. things like that. You know, I remember going to the first public meeting. Yeah. Most <laughs> the of those. Yeah, <laughs> it was not yeah, pretty. pretty. Yeah, I, I, and, and um, Mr. Washburn yeah. called, and we talked a little bit about most of all of that. There's a map here that shows the right. red areas, and they're mostly <clears throat> pretty pretty straight shots. There's one little there's one little part, and I did not ask him about that. That's a little bit larger. Do you know? Um, it just it, right. the, the rest of them seem like sidewalk rights of ways type of thing. But there's another one there. Is it on it the kinda, south side? Yeah, yeah, on the south side. Right. Does it go into the property for some <clears throat> purpose? Can that that um, you're probably looking at the outfall pipe. Mm. Okay. Right. So yeah, we mm -hmm. we do south need side. a drainage easement. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 24. This is an agreement with Howa Medica, however you pronounce that. Uh, and this is for 11 hydraulic structures, seven uh, chair pros, um, and this will be paid for out of the EMS Trust Fund uh, from the state. Move approval. Second. Motion from Commissioner Gerard. Second from Commissioner Long. Mm -hmm. Further discussion? Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes unanimously. Item 25. This is from Safety and Emergency Services to increase the upset limit to the contract with Charter Communications. Uh, again, this provides for their uh, Ethernet and networking services. They're going to add an additional circuit for uh, new Fire Station 19. Questions, discussion, or motion? Move approval. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Flower, second from Commissioner Long. Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes unanimously. Item 26. This is a resolution <coughs> approving issuance of multifamily housing revenue bonds uh, from the Finance Authority. This would be to finance Seminole. Uh, square multifamily residential rental housing um, and amount not to exceed 17.8 million. Again, there's no general fund dollars um, associated with this. Project. <coughs> Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gerard. Second from Commissioner Long. Further discussion. This is just this is bonding approval, right? Correct. I think, no, no, there's no penny either. It's all. Nope. Yep, they, they have applied um, and been approved for penny um, assembly funds, so that was part of the project. But it's actually going, this enables them to go for um, uh, federal dollars, state or federal dollars. Further questions? We have a motion and a second. The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes unanimously. <clears throat> item 27, County Attorney. Under item number 27, I'm requesting you approve the proposed settlement and the confidential uh, memorandum that each of you were individually briefed on uh, and the matter referenced. Questions, discussion, or motion? I have, I have a motion with a question, Mr. Motion Chairman. by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Long. Commissioner Long. Um, is Joe still here? Joe Laurel? No, and Barry's left. Oh, Barry's here. Oh, there you are. Aha. We need to go far. We're anticipating. <laughs> so my okay. question or clarification was, we, we are not using this firm again for a while. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure which firm. This is related to Pepper. Um, this is a matter I can tell you, you all 
granted the county attorney authority to file suit in this matter. This particular settlement was accomplished pre-litigation. However, there are other matters that are in litigation, and my understanding is during the pendency of those lawsuits, the company is barred from contracting with the county. Correct. Other than that, we still have to follow our county policies Correct. and procurement guidelines. Got it. Further questions? Okay. All right. We have a motion and a second. Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes 5-1. Item 28. Under item number 28, I'm requesting authority to file suit in the matter that is referenced. This is a situation where work was done on privately owned property that uh, created damage to our sewer line, and we are requesting authority to recover damages. <coughs> second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Gerard. Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. <coughs> Passes unanimously. Item 29. Under item 29, I'm asking uh, that you adopt the proposed resolution <coughs> that updates the uh, county commission's public participation and decorum rules. You have had the opportunity to hear about this at a work session. Uh, there is, a, I think, a very good um, summary of the changes included with the agenda memo. What I will tell you, this is not a draconian change to, to your policies. Uh, this is something that I think is a good idea to look at um, every few years to make sure that we are consistent with any sort of evolving case law. One of the other important things that we did do is incorporate the virtual participation um, for citizens <coughs> that we really have been undertaking since COVID and we are working in as part of our permanent policy. Questions, discussion, or motion? Uh, moving Going once. <laughs> Move approval. Motion by Commissioner Gerard. Second. Second by Commissioner Long. Further discussion? Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes unanimously. Thank you, County Attorney. <coughs> Any reports? No, sir. All right, item 31, County Administrator. Good afternoon, Commissioners. We're going to provide an overview of the prepared proposed operating and capital budget for 2023. Um, again, this is the <coughs> proposed operating capital budget. Over the next two months, you'll have public hearings. Um, any, you, we'll meet with you, address any concerns, think changes that uh, need to occur between now and then. So we'll just start off um, by going to the next slide. So, and Chris and I are gonna uh, kind of tag team this. I'm gonna take the lead on a lot of this, but. You know, over the last two months, we've been through a lot in terms of developing the 2023 budget. The departments and um, OMB have been working on this since November of 2021. Um, I've met with each constitutional officer appointing authority um, in every single department. You held a series of budget information session, again, with each constitutional officer appointing authority and department and special districts, getting their input, really looking at the needs of the county um, and the revenue sources available to accomplish those goals. Next slide. Now, you know, anytime you prepare a budget, it's a uh, matter of choices and challenges. Uh, you have to look at the needs and you're trying to balance that while meeting your priorities. We set several specific priorities out for this last year. We wanted to look um, at, the, at the tax levy and look at ways in which we could keep our costs low. You've done that for many years. We're in good, very good financial shape because of the conservative practices of this board and past boards uh, to be able to make sure we have strong reserves to be able to weather challenges. Well, we, ha we have those in place. May, this may I interrupt you for just one moment, please? Because I'm trying to figure out where are you on the we, that presentation? The yeah, the PowerPoint. We, he's on a PowerPoint, not the budget. Oh. What you're looking at right is the actual there. budget. Okay. I we don't it. have the we don't have the PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, it's not showing up. It's it's yeah, here. It's now. It's it's it is now. now. Yeah. I it's mean now. we have it on this monitor, but we don't have it on Granicus. Yeah, yeah I do. Yes. There we do. Uh huh. Probably had to reload or something. So is it just loaded? Yeah, it was yeah. Just, it was now? just loaded. Well, no. earlier, but I, I refreshed <laughs> right before the meeting. But okay. okay. Yeah. There, there we is. go. Okay. So we're we're on just the second slide. Um, actually the third slide, and. You know, so we, we've tried to look at 
the needs of the county and and keep our and, and look at our tax rates that was a goal of the commission for us to look at that um, and make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep our property taxes low but we also recognize that we need to invest in our infrastructure that includes our roads our bridges our sidewalks and other transportation infrastructure earlier this year you heard a presentation by Kelly that talked about some of those levels of service and we're going to address that within this budget the other goal and, and direction from the board is to fully implement the mental health coordinated access model. That's something we've worked on with you for uh, several years. This year it will be implemented. Um, and that includes tying that in to the mental health units that uh, are embedded within the sheriff's office and other law enforcement agencies. And, and then we also know that we need to increase our employee salaries in a targeted manner uh, to address um, retention of our, our most valued employees. This proposed budget does a partial rollback of the millage seat. This is the first two-year consecutive uh, reduction since the Great Recession. It's only the second time in 35 years that a millage rate has been reduced for two consecutive years. The proposed, uh, this proposal is to reduce the current millage rate from 5.13 mills to 4.7389 mills. This includes keeping the dedicated money going to the transportation trust fund that you approved last year that we've made good use of in investing in our, in our infrastructure. It also includes an additional millage rate of 0.1738 mills dedicated to enhancing, again, this is not going for personnel and things like that. It's going to enhancing our roads, our bridges, and our transportation infrastructure. Now, you'll, you'll, you'll see in a, a Please don't call it an additional uh, millage. It's a it's an, a dedicated <laughs> millage. It's not additional, it's yeah. included. It's a dedicated millage within the amount that is being proposed here. So the reduction down to 4.71 oh, mills is, is identified. It's identified here on this slide. Right. So we have, uh, as you can see how we break that down, it's a dedicated millage that goes specifically for transportation infrastructure. Um, as Kelly uh, presented to you before, it was about $36 million in order uh, additional uh, dedication that we needed to maintain our roads. What we're recommending is we take a strong bite at that um, by you know, providing about half of that need, and, we'll and we recommend we phase that in over a couple years. But what this does is it allows us to reduce our property tax rate, and therefore, by reducing that, it would save homeowners about $117 over what would have been the full millage rate. The new millage rate for transportation um, would, again, um, represent about half of what was needed. This would allow us to address our backlog largely in the local roads, what, like we were just talking about. As you saw, that we've, we've, we've done a pretty good job with our arterial and collector roads, but not as much with our local roads. Um, and that's and as you saw from the, the project that we just talked about, um, they're, they're replacing them in kind. And, and what we're also doing is we're having to go back and reconstruct roads. Now, on that particular one, that was a road that we took over, so you probably would have had to reconstruct it anyway, probably didn't have the base. But in other roads, we're not able to get to them properly maintain it, so you end up reconstructing a road versus repaving a road, and, and it's not cost-effective. And so we need to get ahead of that, but again, trying to trying to look at the balance on the property tax rate and that need, we've recommended that we, we um, do about half of that and work towards that and phase that in over the next couple of years. The coordinated access model uses um, $1.3 million for the implementation um, uh, from our reserves and the American Rescue Plan, about a million dollars to get this program up and fully operational. This next piece isn't, but uh, isn't as, as um, noticeable to a lot, but I think to you, you really get this, is the optimal data set. This gives us an ability to really look at what is happening in our mental health community. Are we getting outcomes? Rather than creating programs and, and uh, this allows us to track individuals and see if we have successful outcomes. And, and working that through PICA, uh, our, our group that can really look at this data will enable us to really uh, assess where we're at with our mental health programs and make sure they're, they're operating effectively. This continues to fund the Sheriff's Mental Health and Safety Program and the mental health response teams to support law enforcement during mental health crisis. And as you heard from the Sheriff, uh, within 
because we provided the resources last year, again, that allowed for officers to take on more calls of other things. He's able to shift those and now actually expand that program down into Lelman and then to other areas. So we're expanding those teams without asking for additional dollars um, because of the data used to analyze how that program was working. Barry? Commissioner Agri. Sorry, I, uh, I'm about a slide behind you. Okay. Um, so I was just looking at the, the millage rates that you're talking about. Um, so that, how much does the, the, the point one seven three eight translate to? I may have missed that. Did you, a year? 18 uh, million. 18 million. 18 million a year. Correct. So over that nine year period, you're whatever, that's 150, 60 million dollars. Correct. Uh, and, and, and you were saying that that's probably half of what's needed. When Kelly presented to bring the local roads, which we're, we're funding at a D level, um, that would, 36 million brings us up to a C level. Okay. And um, so it gets us up to a, a state of good repair, but it took her about nine years to phase that in. So, you yeah, know. And I, and I kind of understand the normal, you know, how you normally take care of roads if you're on top of things. But to me, and again, I'm just trying to find alternatives here because mm -hmm. I'm certainly a, a, an inf infrastructure I'm all about that, but um, so I'm trying to think about how you know you can accelerate the process for the other, and this is really I, I'm calling it a an intergenerational expenditure in reverse mm -hmm. because there's people that have not had their their roads done in probably 40 years, 30 years in some cases, and you can go around and, and, and identify some of those some of those spots. So I was trying to think of a ways that we could maybe take away a millage rate, but maybe do some do some financing. We have such low rates right now, um, and there's the ability to spread these dollars out a little bit more, and to do and to be even more aggressive on getting caught up. And I was just wondering if that's an option that you all looked at, um, and what that would translate to in terms of, you know, corresponding costs. So. Uh, Commissioner, I, I do believe that is an option. We certainly can look at that. Um, and and what what you would propose is rather than doing eighteen million dollars a year, you we do a a, a loan of fifty yeah. million dollars or whatever, Cheap. and really attack it up front, and then pay that back over the next over several the time. years. Yeah. We we could look over at, more than nine years. I mean, we're talking. Yeah, you we know, could we could look at financing things like that. The the thing I think we'd have to look at is what would it take to manage a package like that and the lead time and the, mm -hmm. you know, and, and things like that. Oh. So, but, but those are, those are all options that we certainly could, uh, could look at. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Long. So in thinking that through, one of the reasons that I might be convinced to agree with Commissioner Eggers on that point is because I clearly remember when we were in the process of widening Elmerton Road. And the whole focus was on that, bringing it up to a, I want to say it was a, not a C, but a B category. Uh -huh. However, because of the length of time it took us to get that done, by the time we did get it done, it was no longer a B category. I don't know if anybody remembers all of that. But that's my concern, is the length of time it takes between when we approve something and we let it out for construction and then they actually start working on it, you're looking at a very long time before that gets completed. And how far does that put us behind from the point where we started till we f actually finish it? It's just a constant start all over again. Well, you have a lot of projects on the books right now that staff's working on. Um, but I, I mean, I think the challenge that you just provided to us is, and we could bring back options to you, um, because if what I would suggest is, for instance, we, how many roads can we um, repave and therefore they don't deteriorate and, and cause additional costs later and do those, those are easy. Those don't take four years. Right. If you're reconstructing, you need right away, it takes a, at least three or four years. And so um, we, could, we could divide the projects up like that, and I could work with staff, and we could come back to you with some options. I think it would be, since we're in the um, budget cycle and, anyway. And well, but th your funding would be the same. You, right. If you commit to this in the multi-year, then we just have to have to, we use that source to pay back that loan. Um, but we could bring back options for you. So we front load, we use 18 million to pay off the debt every we, year the easiest one would be to do a loan out of our reserve of solid waste yeah like you we've know, done before like like you did CDC. with the penny 
a couple of years or at the last penny. And so you, you, you kind of did some projects and then paid that back. And so there's, there's easy ways of doing it without like a bond issue and something okay. that's more elaborate. But, but at the same time, when you spread that out over a longer period of time than nine years, it can reduce the, the, the hit for the year. Yeah. Too. So uh, the you idea could. is, again, if the idea is what we're trying, one of your, pr one of your principles here was to obviously help our residents with, mm -hmm. you know, with taxes this year. And I think you've, you've done a good job with that, at least in the proposed budget. What I was trying to go is a, a step further and see how, if, if you could justify the expansion of the payout because of the nature of the work, okay, that it might relieve a little bit of the pressure each year going forward. Because it's not just for those who are, you know, using those roads today. It's for the, you know, people that are using those roads 10 years from now or 20 years from now. So there's an intergenerational component to it. I just wanted to explore it. That's you could all. do that. You could, you know, again, this is a proposed military. You could go, you know, 4.85. You could go, oh, no, you know. no, no, no. I didn't no, think not, you were going no, there. That's but, not why I was yeah, going quite go the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll <laughs> always take additional money, you know, for no. that. But, but what, you, what you presented, we could present options for you. And I have to really talk to Kelly about the types of local roads and issues. But remember, it's not all going to local roads. We're behind on some of our bridge um, work and doing things to where they don't have to weight limit um, bridges. Um, and some of our guardrail and, and maintenance. So some, uh, some uh, you know, about a piece of that is also going to those. So, you know, we've tried to create a balance. 36 million was really all, all in, but it was on both sides, bridges, maintenance, and roads. <coughs> and so we, we need to kind of evaluate a proposed package for you. I, we, I would assume that you'd also have to look at our actual capacity well, for doing the work. Uh -huh. If we had 100 million set aside, do we have the supplies and the vendors and everyone it, to actually do the work? It yeah. is a huge issue right. right now because of federal money and a, and a lot of people doing a lot of infrastructure. And so there is a capacity issue yeah. there, and that's the reason I'd, I would ask yeah. that we bring back ideas for you, and then we can discuss it at yeah. that time. And I know roads aren't sidewalks. Yeah. Sidewalks are a lot easier, but you've done a great job in the last year bringing those backlog of sidewalk problems mm -hmm. up to speed. So Staff that's, a that's been a great that. addition. So, mm -hmm. um, and I just think if we spread it a little bit more, it can relieve the pressures <clears throat> on costs in the current year. So, no, I wasn't talking about raising the millage. I was talking about going the other direction, spreading it more. So thank you. Okay. Commissioner Gerard. Well, I think it would be <laughs> it's an interesting idea. That's not what I got from what you were saying. But um, yeah, if we could borrow from ourselves, it would be we'd be able to meet those capacity limits without spending interest on money we don't need yet. Well, you'd have to so pay the interest, like, but only you what, have to, yeah, but not, yeah, you'd have yeah. to pay the fund back and with interest, but a lot yeah, easier. We wouldn't have to borrow. That's correct. And then be testing our capacity all the time. We would know what we needed. And you need, you know, again, we'd, we'd, we'd want to do that for a portion only because yeah. some of the other stuff yeah. would be maintenance that we're trying to get caught up on on the on the guardrails and bridges and things like that but but again I think it's a great idea um, we haven't looked at that that's something we could look at and bring it back to you yeah I think every avenue should be explored that's not but um, as long as you don't mess with my favorite slide of the year when we get audited and we have the lowest debt oh, ratio right, right, right. of any <laughs> urban county in Florida <laughs> right. um, that's, that's my favorite slide of the year so it still will be. <laughs> okay, it so again, commissioners, be. this reduces our property tax uh, rate um, from 5.1 to 4.7, and um, again, continues that trend. Hey, hey Barry, one more question real quick on the uh, value increase that you're anticipating this year. That, uh, that 4.43, the reduction from what we are now to that number is about the same number, isn't it? as the estimated increase in values? Isn't it about 12 or 13 percent? No, Commissioner, I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll come back. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Keep going. Next slide. Next slide. So as you also know that we've been challenged with our workforce, as every company um, in Pinellas County has, has faced those same challenges. As you're also aware, over the last several years, we've really <coughs> invested in our employees, though. We now have, and we're pretty proud of this, we have career ladders in place um, to where, as people gain skills, they get compensated for that. You know, it also allows us to retain employees from using those skills and going other places. Uh, we've reclassified certain positions. We've implemented recognition programs not only within the departments, but at the county board. 
Uh, we've implemented a remote work policy um, and work to create uh, benefit packages that are what our employees want. We need to do more there, um, but we've, we've made you know, um, certain progress there. However, as we've also seen, um, the, the competition for skilled workforce is, is tremendous, and we've seen turnover rates uh, even in some departments greater than 30 percent. Um, and there's, you, you simply have to address the competition within the area um, to keep our employees. This budget includes, included within the rates that has been <coughs> proposed, a 3 percent salary increase of midpoint, as we've done for many, many years, for our employees. It also provides for a $1,200 increase for each employee into their base wage. What this really does is it recognizes that if, you're, if you fill up and you have a, you, you fill up and it, your gas costs more or you go to the grocery store, it costs more regardless of whether you're an entry level um, position or a most senior level position. And so this provides a flat amount to everybody's base wage. It cost us 2% overall um, into our budget. Um, but it, it helps out lower paid employees more so than um, higher paid employees. And I think that that's fair given the hyper um, inflation that we've seen you know, over this past year. But it also provides for a non-reoccurring 2%, um, 2 which is also be, would be um, distributed in the same manner of $1,200 as kind of a retention bonus in November and probably June. Um, but again, overall 5% to the base, 2% additional. And we're seeing that that's probably even on the low end of what I'm seeing in many local governments um, around the region. Uh, uh. No, uh, I'll wait. Okay, next slide. In the decision packages, we obviously had to be very careful in order to be able to accomplish this tax rate, uh, be very selective and what we would recommend to you for consideration in your decision packages. In, within this um, proposed um, budget, we include creation of a cultural plan um, that we would do this in cooperation uh, with Creative Pinellas and our CVB. Um, they, would, they would work to create a countywide plan and look at our arts. This would be funded through CVB. Um, but we would also, um, and you know, I found out since our um, budget information sessions, there's actually been a lot of work trying to tie in um, our arts uh, to, with our marketing that we do throughout Pinellas County at the CBB. They've spent a considerable amount of money, but, it, but I don't think that necessarily it's, it's understood and coordinated. So we've also set aside $200,000, uh, again, as a um, cultural advertising and marketing pilot program to really get the, uh, the discussion going around how to make sure that we link those um, and to where uh, all residents and visitors know about the cultural assets that we have uh, throughout the county. And so we've set aside money. It's actually been within their budget. They've been doing a lot in this area. And so having a targeted amount that we work with Creative Pinellas and identifying exactly where and how we go about that uh, is something that's supported by both CVB um, and, Cre and Creative Pinellas. So, so is that is that, that first the two hundred forty thousand? Is that something that's already in their budget? It it will be, well. That's it, we're it, recommending it, be put into their the budget for the first. And, and we're setting the the amount that they have. Kevin, we we set aside. They had a million dollars set aside, and so we're carving out two hundred thousand of the million. So it's it, we've already spent. We already are spending a million. Uh, in um, cooperative advertising, we're just saying designated the two hundred thousand. We're going to work. Um, we're going to designate and make sure it's a cooperative uh, program between CBB, Creative Pinellas, because there hasn't been the linkage. And I think um, even though they're doing a lot of work, there is a sense that we're not doing a lot in that space. And in fact, <coughs> they are. And so we want to call it out and make sure that there's that coordination and communication, because CBB sees it as a value add uh, to a destination and uh, something that they uh, have been supporting and want to support going forward. Okay, and again, those would be funded out of that. Over in safety and emergency services, uh, this would be uh, $877,000 for the safety and emergency services portion of Prime, uh, which is our consolidated CAD project. Um, I was just meeting with the sheriff yesterday. We all agree as a number one safety enhancement, we'll be one of the few places in the nation that has everybody on a consolidated CAD to where police 
see each other work to, it, together, and it significantly improves the safety of our community with that implementation. Yesterday, I saw uh, I, uh, in the background he was talking about live 911. Yes. Is this what we're calling? No, that's that's something separate that they've done on, okay. on the sheriff side. Okay. Um, and that and but it does feed into like the next piece, which is vid, uh, video 911 feeds. And, and being able to again be able to push as much information out as possible and so as you can see I didn't want to approve any decision packages this year because I was really focused around keeping that rate but when you get into some of these they're basic public safety issues and you can't ignore them and we're going to get into the other area which is cybersecurity and things like that I don't know how you not do them um, but it's you know a challenge so what is the video for 911 I'm gonna I'm gonna let our resident expert come up and explain that <laughs> uh, Jim Fogarty, Director of Emergency Services. Right. City of Largo Police Department is currently using live uh, video streaming for um, scene uh, uh, and evidentiary capturing mm -hmm. and several other uh, law enforcement agencies. The EMS system is intending to use it for capturing <clears throat> uh, CPR uh, quality during uh, mm -hmm. the event and several other applications. And uh, again, and and so out of 911, we also want to create a, a, a redundant um, wide area network. Um, we've had a couple instances where our system has went down, and so again, that provides redundancy within that system. It's a public safety issue, um, and then an additional position that will actually create more money than it costs to bring in. So um, can we add several of those? I, that's what, <laughs> it, it was an easy discussion when they say we can bring in a, we think we can bring in a million dollars. Can I have this position? Well, that's kind of easy. Have Just a need a hundred of those guys. <laughs> Commissioner Gerard. Having issues with staffing over there or we haven't, to, uh, is it included in the budget to do uh, no. salary adjustments or anything? Um, not at this point. We're going to make a modification based upon the discussion that I had with you individually. Um, regarding some adjustments out there that has not been announced yet and so okay. um, I, I don't want to do that here on TV <laughs> so okay. um, but yeah we'll have to make a bu budget modification associated with that okay. over then uh, on the next slide um, we partially implemented the park level service increase and in particular you know we presented that plan to you last year we, we've really targeted the increases, and in this particular case, those increases would be to add two additional park rangers to Wheaton Island. Currently, and you know, just from a safety standpoint, we don't have park rangers out there all the time. Um, and so because of that <coughs> lack of coverage, and um, this would provide two, park rank, two additional park rangers to where we'd have at least one person in the park at, at all times. Um, we've also added in here three additional maintenance workers. And I recall we got parks up on uh, onto our new um, platform to where they're managing their maintenance. This would put, uh, assign two down to Fort DeSoto. Um, right now we pull people out of other areas and they drive, <laughs> you know, a long way to be able to provide maintenance services down in Fort DeSoto. This allows us to keep our park in a good state of repair and one additional maintenance person to get on, up on the backlog of um, general maintenance within the rest of the park system. Bear, Bear, could you provide us, not, not today, but just provide us with what we did last year and what we're proposing this year for parks? Absolutely. There seemed to be quite a few positions we added last year. I think quite a few. I'm not quite sure. I don't want to say hundreds or tens, but there was a few. There were. If we could just do that and maybe add, see what we're doing this year as well. I can show, yeah, I can show you the park level service and what we've added between last okay. year and what we're proposing this year. Thank Absolutely. You. Um, See. And finally, we're also recommending that we do a 5% increase for our human services nonprofit partners. Um, and, and this is a significant amount, and I know this has been requested for a few years, but you know, our, our nonprofits are facing the same challenges of staffing that we are. Um, and so providing a, a small level of funding increase for them um, to, give, to be a good you know, partner in providing the services that they provide for us. Um, fun, um, next, you know, we, we discussed the nursing um, issues at the jail, um, and the sheriff asked for additional money uh, for uh, the, uh, making some pretty significant salary adjustments for competition for nurses. Um, again, we support that. Uh, we support the uh, printer for the supervisor of elections. 
uh, the technology enhancements, and some of that is one-time money we can pay for uh, with just one-time money for where it's a one-time need. But um, that would be over in uh, the public <coughs> defender's office. Uh, they did ask for uh, um, so the case managers and the uh, mental health therapist uh, over in the public defender's office. And finally, uh, the last item is partial funding. They requested more, <coughs> but, and this is to help clients uh, where we can gap <coughs> fill positions. We, we recommended we do a partial funding of that and we look at the effectiveness and where we're spending dollars and what the real need is uh, before we recommend additional dollars in future years. Some of the other packages include Oracle upgrade, uh, the ERP upgrade, which is a, a, an additional year of implementation of getting our ERP module up for Oracle um, in both BTS and the Circuit Court Controller's Office. One of those major packages is giving us a human resources system that currently doesn't exist. Um, and so uh, we also recommended an additional human resources learning development consultant. Um, and, and what this really does is invest in our employees into training um, and preparing, you know, we're already starting up with uh, both dressing first line managers and the training they need to be successful in doing their job. We also want to work on developing future leaders and giving them the courses and the training to where they can step in and, and kind of do succession planning uh, for our next generation. And then finally, we're asking to increase a referral incentive program. What this would provide is um, we, we know that a, a person referred by a current employee stays, uh, the, the, it's 80% to 50% um, that they stay at least three years. And so um, and somebody that is referred it's a, has a, a much better retention rate than somebody that just comes in off the street. And so we want to recognize that and encourage our employees to refer people. And so this would provide <coughs> for a referral incentive um, uh, if, uh, if, if somebody, a current employee, would refer someone. We think that's a cost-effective way of, of getting employees. Um, question. Um, Commissioner. Before we, I was just flipping the thing, so before we get to the penny, I just was, if you could maybe provide us um, kind of a, essentially a use of reserves. Kind of, I know last year we were at a certain level uh, percentage and also <coughs> dollar amounts. And this year, at, uh, with this budget, we're going to have a different number, and that that reserve will change. And I was just wondering if you could perhaps um, delineate what those items that are what you're calling out for for that use. If you remember, and I I'm, I'm reminded of it quite often, but uh, you remember a couple of years ago as we headed into the recession, um, or not recession, but the pandemic issues that we were unsure of what was going to happen. Sure. The state built reserves and we built reserves. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the things that you did is you cut costs that year to almost the same level of costs as the previous year. And we took advantage of the property value increase to build reserves. The idea was that the following year, if, if the economy didn't tank like we were thinking it could, and right. everybody was projecting that as a possibility, that those reserves would be then returned. In effect, lowered back down to a more normal level. So that's put that aside for a minute. And I just was wanting to make sure that we're monitoring the use of those reserves like that we're talking about. <coughs> You've mentioned it a couple times in here. So if maybe we could just see what you're talk what, what yeah. you're addressing in that reserve reduction this year and what those projects are. That would be helpful. We absolutely can do that. Um, there, you'll see the reserves um, staying roughly the same. Um, I, it's a it's a minor use of reserves within um, this program that we have here. Um, and if you recall back when we we um, in essence um, reduced cost and then we use we use the money from that property tax to phase in over a couple of years. And that's the reason for separate from the money that we put in transportation trust fund did a full rollback in the property tax rate for that next year. So we did use that capacity with because we still had increased cost in the sheriff's, you know, and the sheriff's cost for his employees and our employees and things like that. But we can outline that and kind of show you how that phased uh, I, in. I get all that, and that's what I want to follow. But at the same time, I'm still, I'm still questioning why we're at 24 percent reserves or 23 percent reserves. That's a different conversation. It, it but I'd like to track and see what you're using. Okay, you know, we that. we can certainly call out the the items that that we're using Thank you. for one time. Money Appreciate it, Barry. Um, next slide. Okay, and as you know, um, we are balanced <coughs> on the penny um, uh, this year. And as you recall, 
Thank over the you. last couple of years. We've had some questions about that. Um, you know, we, we, the penny only began in January of, of, you know, of 2020. And so, you know, they, they started then put looking at the projects, trying to look at the original list that was passed and, and we took and promised to the community in 2017. Well, since that time, we thought we were going to have a 6% reduction in the penny. Uh, that ended up not occurring. But again, you're trying to project what's occurring in the pandemic. And now we have, we're, as, as we started designing some of the projects, well, now you have scope creep, but m most, most notably, you have cost increases. Um, but the penny has done very, very well. And so um, fortunately, between those sl very slight use of ARPA funds, the penny is now balanced. And so the penny projects are, uh, the, that are listed in there, um, again, um, outline back to the 2017 list. There's a lot of different projects. The ones that are most seen are the community projects, uh, but this is what we maintain, you know, all of our infrastructure with, you know, which is a lot. And so, um, again, you know, that this has been a monumental project of an ever-changing environment <coughs> over, the, you know, the last couple of years, and it's a big credit to Jackie and her staff on trying to bring all this together and work with all of our project <coughs> managers to get estimates on uh, various construction projects that we have throughout the county. <coughs> Last time I'll mention it, we do maintain healthy reserves, um, and we'll have that discussion. Um, but again, the, the, as you know, uh, everything's increased. And so our constitutional officers and our departments have done a very good job of holding the line on spending. That's just to absorb the cost increases uh, from contracts to you know, everything else. So. You know, as you, as you recall, for the departments to report to me, they no longer get an automatic, you know, inflationary increase. We rolled that back and said, make choices, live within your means. Um, and so they're trying to do that to the extent they can. However, when they have justification and contract increases, then we make adjustments to those, and that's reflected in the budget. What I really want everybody to, to take away is that, you know, it, it's a difficult environment because um, you're trying to work with contractors and businesses that have cost increases too. And we're trying to work with them and be good partners to be able to maintain a budget that reduces the rate at the same time continuing all of our different services. Um, next slide. So overall, that's a lot to get to. Our proposed budget, our proposed operating budget uh, for next year is $2.5 the proposed capital budget is $794 million. Uh, this is the 20, FY23 part of the six-year plan. The general fund is $917.8 million with $499 million of uh, revenue from property taxes. This includes 5,519 full-time uh, equivalent positions. Now, at that, at, if that you track that, um, you know, <coughs> It, we've seen slight increases, and that's mainly in the parks area and very few others over the last. Uh, for instance, in the Board of Commissioner Departments, uh, last year was 2,185, now we're at 2,205. And that includes the additional positions in, for instance, building and development services. Okay, We added some additional positions there. Why? Because they're busier than they've ever been and we needed to provide additional positions, and it's supported by the revenue from the permits, you know, but those, those add to staff without <coughs> actually increasing cost on the general fund or on our taxpayers, but that's, those are additional positions that are needed, as you all yeah. know. Yeah, I think well, there are a lot of people out there who, who are desperately hoping to get better turnaround, right, on, we, their, on and, the permits. And, and, and we're 100 percent focused yeah. on that, yeah. and we've authorized not just positions for next year, we authorize them now. Um, we've authorized them over in plant building and development, and they're looking not only at process, but actually people. Um, but we're also doing it, for instance, the other area that we had backed up is on um, dock permits. Um, and so Kelly, we authorized an additional position for Kelly there. And also, we're also trying to get creative um, in, you know, can we certify contractors that do things right for certain types of things and only spot check rather than do every single one? Mm. You know, there's always risk in that. You know, you don't want to do that for life safety, but can you do it for other things? So we're challenging staff to be creative in the way in which they meet the customer service needs and our public's, you know, demand. 
one more question, Barry, on, on, on the number of, those are the number of positions we have. And I remember a few years ago, we had a lot of positions that weren't ever filled and you took care of a lot of, a lot of that early on. What of that 200, 2,205 under your control, how many of those are open right now? Um, um, I do not have an answer for you on that. No, I'm just curious, you know, I we've could, been talking about employee issues, yeah. so. Um, you don't I, have to have it, today. it It would be a guess. I could certainly find out, yeah. but I mean, it, as you met with, and we, as we had the budget information sessions, <coughs> I, I don't think there's a department out there, maybe a small department that doesn't have, you know, 10, 15, you know, percent of their workforce unfilled. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a constant challenge and they're, you know, they, uh, human resources have been great partners and getting creative, how we do job fairs, getting the word out, social media and all the different you know, methods that we can use to fill positions. And as you also know, uh, people like Megan have done just a yeoman's job and creating you know, pipelines uh, from working with you know, the public schools to other places uh, to offer avenues for people to be employed. So we need to do more of it um, across the board, uh, but, the, but they're certainly working on I it. I think the difference is these are the positions you feel we need and we're just trying to fill them. That's correct. Instead of just having open positions that, you yeah, know. Yeah, we, we no longer, uh, you know, the, so, you know, on, on the, what, what we had before was a projection of positions. We no longer have projections of positions. They're, they're not built in any position that we add. We're coming to you and bringing it to you for your approval. Nothing's pre-approved. Just FYI, on the Pinellas County website, there's 55 openings on the Pinellas County job search site. You mean being advertised for? Being advertised. <laughs> wow. I don't know how many else yeah, are out there in transition yeah. or whatever <laughs> else, but 55 right now. Yeah. And that was a free advertising that you just gave. And, and, and <laughs> if I give a free advertising on that, I mean, I we've also challenged our staff to make sure that, you know, when we talk about a position and we put up an hourly wage, that let's compare it to the private sector. You're going to pay more for insurance. You're probably at the most going to have a 3% match in your 401k. Let's Let's talk about the total value of the position, because sometimes I think that puts us at a disadvantage. Um, but for somebody supporting a family, it makes it a very good position. And just as a, an aside, if we are if we had 2,205 employees that we wanted to be working this past year, for example, and 1,900 were working, those those unfunded positions go to reserves essentially, don't they? I mean, yes, extra, they, in, in some cases, in other cases, it goes to overtime. So, for instance, at 911, 911, you know, the reason we're the reason I, I addressed with you all some yeah. of the changes that I want to make is because now we're forcing people to work overtime because the bottom line, phone has to contracted be answered, work too. You know, yeah, right. yeah. So, yeah. so okay. part of it is a shifting, yeah. but part of it certainly does yeah. go to reserves. Okay, thank you. Okay, next slide. So. You know, the next steps. Um, so this is a proposed budget. You all have it. We are available to meet with you at any time and ask any questions. So please uh, feel free to, uh, any, uh, to ask any question that you have. We'll bring that to you. We, have, we do have to set a proposed maximum millage on August the 2nd, um, and we're continuing to review this. In other words, the 4.7, um, if we set it at 4.7, you cannot increase <laughs> it past that amount. So we would propose that we do something a little higher in anticipation of your discussions, but not up to the full rate. Again, that is only a temporary measure until the board makes a final decision on the millage. <coughs> the trim notices will be mailed to all property owners on August the 22nd. The first budget hearing will be September the 8th, and the second budget hearing will be September the 22nd. I want to just take this time, you know, quickly to thank the commissioners. I mean, this has been a pretty engaging process through the budget. We've had lots of discussions, very direct conversations about the priorities of the board, priorities of the community, and needs of our operating departments and constitutional officers. Um, but I do want to thank the commissioners, the constitutional officers, appointing authorities, and all of our department heads for working with us. It's a collaborative process. It can't be done any other way. Um, I also want to take take the time to thank our new um, <coughs> OMB director, Chris Rose, who's right here. So this was his first shot out of the gate, and, and he came in at a time of great change. Um, our OMB staff has worked tirelessly this year. They have, and under a lot of change. Made a lot of changes to the OMB structure. So we had some new analysts coming in, had to learn quick and work with our departments. 
They've done a lot of analysis, but we have a lot more to do. And I really want to thank them because they were put in a challenging time and a, and, and a lot of change, and they delivered. And they delivered a budget that I think is responsible <coughs> and, um, and, and I think supports uh, the, the priorities that you've set out. Um, with that, uh, this is my proposed budget commissioners, and uh, I await any questions that you have. Further questions? Commissioner Long. Um, I don't have a question, Barry, but I do have a couple comments. <clears throat> I had to walk out for a minute and get a throat lozenge, and I apologize. I heard you talking when I came back in about the work from the staff and all of that. I want to just share that I started that enormous book that David's got at his desk and I have on mine. I started reading it, and I was so impressed with the way in which the budget message, the summary and the message in the front of it lays out everything. It was extraordinary, and I was exhausted by the time I finished that part of it. So compliments to you, to those, to the staff. staff, Chris, everybody in your department, <coughs> all of the administrative staff. I just cannot say enough about how tirelessly they work to respond to us and to make us look as good as we do. So thank you. It's very much appreciated. For the well, questions or comments? Mr. Yeah. Eggers. Yeah. Um, on, and we have a workshop or two in, in, in August. And if we, if we get to that August 2nd meeting, we have some additional, we could probably have another workshop mixed Absolutely. in there. Absolutely. I okay. mean, um, on this top, it, on this. Well, the, the hearings are set, and we have to advertise for those. But if there's other different. discussions you want to have yeah. okay. at, at any time. I mean, we may not need them, but on the other hand, we have a couple workshops if we wanted to add some additional conversations. About what? About budget. budget. Oh, about if we have some, you know, we're getting some more information back, and we'll be looking at that and, you know, have a joint conversation. I mean, it doesn't really affect your trim notices. It doesn't affect your maximum millage, all that stuff, but it just has additional conversation. So I just want to make sure we have that option available to us if we need it. Mm -hmm. And I think we, you know, as the Tampa Bay Times recognized, um, we're one of the few government entities in the Bay Area that's looking at millage reductions as a reflection of um, not just to do it, not just because we want to cut taxes, but as a, a reality and a reaction to the realities that our citizens are facing every day right now. And so um, I appreciate that being one of the four pillars that we've committed to during this budget process is how can we, how can we make things a little bit better for our citizens in this process? And I think that's an important part of how we do it. So I appreciate that part very much. Um, for the questions. All right, thank you very much, sir. Yep. Thank you. Uh, item 32, appointment to the Parks and Conservation Resources. Uh, we have a ballot. Two, right. We have a ballot. Uh, we need to choose two. There are only two that are qualified. Mm -hmm. uh, Cynthia Grizzle and Miles Kroom. Is there a motion for those two? Move approval. approval. Motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Long for the appointment of Grizzle and Kroom. The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Mm -hmm. Passes unanimously. Next, we have an appointment for the Pinellas County Construction Licensing Board. Choose one. One is qualified. William Sheehan. You see the comments <laughs> by uh, staff for his appointment. Is there a motion for approval? Move approval. approval. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Long for the appointment of William Sheehan for the Pinellas County Construction Licensing Board. The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes unanimously. Uh, County Commission new business item 34. I do have uh, three requests for Skyway lighting resolutions. Uh, one is from Saddle Up Riding Club for drug overdose awareness. Drug overdose awareness. One for World Diabetes Day, and one for Inform Families First. Uh, this is about uh, emergency contact information given uh, during a vehicle <coughs> registration in case of accidents. Um, are there questions, or is there a motion to approve one or all three? Well, I have a question, um, if I may. Yes, ma'am. Do we have any criteria for how we establish what we approve for that bridge and what we don't? This, um, I'm. I'm thinking about several times over the last year that we've approved something for the bridge and the color 
change and you have to wonder like how many citizens know what, why that is and what it means and what's the reflection of it and it occurs to me that as time goes by we could end up with uh, you know Huge. different colors every day and nobody I'm would sorry know. different color every day and nobody well, would yeah know. I know. and uh, <laughs> I'm just curious if we've we, given that any thought, or is it just, you know, whatever comes along, we say okay, and nobody cares, but I do. I love the bridge, and I think it's magnificent how it is right now. <coughs> well, I think that, we, no, we have not established criteria for this board's uh, approval on any of the organization requests. Um, we have not received many that have not been the traditional organizations that you think of. Right. Um, I think... Most people, you have the ones that kind of people know as far as like pink for maybe uh, breast cancer awareness. Beyond that, maybe the rainbow for pride. Uh, beyond that, I don't know <coughs> if when they see it lit up. Um, you know, it was blue and yellow years ago for something else, and people thought it was this year for Ukraine, and it wasn't for until the next month that we did a Ukraine uh, resolution. Right. Uh, I think what happens mostly is that organizations will go out and take a picture of the bridge with their color, and then they'll share that on their social media and advertising. Um, but if, no, I, I don't know if people know, and I don't know, and I don't, quite frankly, I don't have the colors for these different organizations, so I don't know what color they'll be. <coughs> um, and then there's the fact that the Department of Transportation lights the bridge on their own without our consultation, you know, even though they said it was required. Right. So um, right. we get these requests from time to time, and I bring them to you. Commissioner Seal. What is to inform families first again? I was trying this to is an uh, initiative about, uh, and I, I had to learn about it myself, that when you get your vehicle registration, you can, you're given the option, um, apparently in DMV, of providing emergency contact information so that if there's a accident and the person in the car is incapacitated, by pulling up the vehicle registration, they will have a information emergency contact so that they could call. Hmm. Or maybe if somebody locks their child in the hot car, they could Who knew? go arrest them. Right. Questions? Right. Further questions? Is there a motion to approve one or all three? Move approved. Move approved. All three. All three. Second. Motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Flowers. Further discussion? The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Oh, we will. <laughs> okay. <coughs> I'm in. I'm a yes. I would just be curious how much it costs every time for them to... Okay. And it passes five to one. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. Uh, Department of Transportation. A color wheel. You no, know, wheel. someone right. up there in Tallahassee yeah. hits a button that, and it changes. Yeah. All right, yeah, uh, further all further new business or committee boards, et cetera, et cetera. We'll start Commissioner Gerard. Uh, I don't have any committee or board significant things other than that we do have a, a start date for the... Sunrunner, which is October 21st. Come on out and cut the ribbon. Um, uh, I had a meeting today with the uh, students working against tobacco who brought some information about, and I know they're trying to meet with a few people uh, who wanted to talk about um, adopting the, the new statute about well that allows us to ban smoking on the beach and in parks on county owned beaches and parks yeah we mentioned or city I, owned i mean we mentioned that i don't remember if you were uh, during the last work session no, maybe i wasn't um maybe i wasn't listening that uh <laughs> that could have been that could have been that the case. possibly be <laughs> but that i talked to with the administrator about that when the law was changed um senator gruder's uh, uh, legislation passed and uh, he was already worked with our Parks Department uh, staff okay. as far as uh, bringing about options for us and our what we control, but also about meeting with city managers. Uh, the, the beach managers have already started talking about what they want to do right. on their properties. But we can't really do anything countywide, right? Well, I don't know. All, I think that was county part owned. of the discussion coming back of public beach. I, yeah, I defer to the county attorney, but my understanding is it's for the beaches that we control. So it'd be, right. you know, Fred Howard, San Kia, and uh, Port DeSoto. Port DeSoto, yeah. I mean, we, we as can well as the I, parks. You I mean. generally have the ability to do something countywide. The thing is, is that the counties, or I'm sorry, <coughs> the municipalities can choose to opt out. Or if they have ordinances currently on the books that are inconsistent, that would be an automatic. <coughs> 
Um, cause this isn't really a countywide power. And when it's not, there's always the municipal option to right. implement their own policy. Okay. And they had a discussion at the big C and, um, there was a, a lot of interest from, I'm sure. from, from the, uh, mayors to, uh, move in that direction. But again, that's going to be for a future discussion. Paul's going to be going to the big C. He's also then going to take that to his park conservation resource advisory committee. Um, and then we'll schedule it for a work session. Great. Commissioner Seal, anything? Commissioner Eggers. Just two things on those on that bridge lighting. I sure would like to see that Ukrainian color up there, not just once a year. I don't know how often it gets up there, so if you could slip that in, I think that would be great. And then I, the only other comment was I just was really, um, I don't know. I'm always impressed with the employees that we bring here. And, mm -hmm. and, and, yes. And, and, and Tony, it was... Um, Wow, what a what an incredible spirit there, and and he left us with what did he say? Do something kind. If you do have, something I kind. I just thought that was such a great message. Obviously, in this world today, we so much going on. That's all <laughs> some good, some bad, and not some you know ugly. But um, on the I just thought that was a great message and loved his energy. So that's all I have. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Long. Do you have anything? <clears throat> well, the only thing I wanted to just bring up was the fact that Bishop Parks passed away. What? At, mm -hmm. Sally Parks? Bishop. Bishop oh. Parks. Bishop oh. of the Diocese. I Bishop. thought you said Commissioner Parks. Ooh. Gregory Parks of the right. Diocese yeah. of St. Petersburg. What? <laughs> and um, I just really felt really horrible about that. He has suffered so much with his foot. and With his leg, right? His, his leg, he, after he had it amputated, and he just never really... So I just wanted to have uh, a moment to share that and how important it is to the Diocese of St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you, Commissioner. You're welcome. Commissioner Flowers? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to uh, say sad news and good news. Sad news is that Amy Foster will be leaving the HLA, no. yes. uh, Homeless Leadership Alliance. Um, but the good news is she'll be going back over to the city of St. Petersburg as the uh, Community Neighborhood Affairs Administrator. So the homeless initiatives and things will still fall under her purview. The housing initiatives still fall under her purview, but she also inherits sanitation. So um, uh, we, we will still have her, you know, working in the realm. Um, I believe her new role starts in August, if I'm not mistaken. What is it? What is she going to community? She is neighborhood? the Community Neighborhood Affairs Administrator. Many of you may remember Mike Dove from so many years ago. Oh. That was his role, so that's what she will be doing. Um, so I think that'll be a good thing. I, right. I, I'm excited for her, but sad for the HLA. Um, and so having said that, um, um, you know, there's a strategic process for trying to find a replacement because we've done so many wonderful things and we have different grant processes in the hopper right. that we want to make sure that staff um, feel supported, um, that there <coughs> remains consistency for a lot of things that are going on, um, but that whomever uh, leads the operation will um, certainly follow in some of the same footsteps, but also bring some of their own flair. Um, those of us that attended the Florida Association of Counties Conference, it was a good conference, I thought. Um, I got a lot of good information from it. Um, and uh, so we have a new president of the FAC. Um, Commissioner Constantine, so some people remember him from being up in Tallahassee, but he's the new president and he has already hit the ground running. Um, and so I've received a word about my committee assignments, so the things that I asked for I got, and the things that I was on I got back, so I appreciate that. <laughs> I know um, Commissioner Justice and Commissioner Long serve on a couple of committees. I don't know where they may be with that process, um, but I'm excited um, for his, his new leadership. And um, I had a chance to um, participate with the graduating class, <laughs> so I've completed my second <laughs> portion of the ICC leadership, and so I'll be registering for the last portion, which is in August, to go through that last leg of that. But I have found it to be really um, interesting and really helpful mm -hmm. um, in talking through some of the things that we have going on in our county, um, and in some instances, sharing what we're doing, which is new to those counties, and them sharing with me 
things that they're doing in their county, um, and then maybe you know sharing ideas and bringing them on board. So it was a it was a really good conference, I thought, and um, I look forward to the legislative conference that'll be coming up where. You know, we're talking about um, putting together platforms and things of that nature. Why are you smiling? Uh, Just reacting uh, to Commissioner Long. So, um, so start thinking about if there's anything that you want shared within the various committees that could potentially be put up for a platform <coughs> issue. Please, you know, share because um, I would love to, uh, you know, forward that on. Um, I know Commissioner Long on a number of occasions has um, put some things forward and they actually made it to the platform, you know, voted through by the body, made it to the platform, and then that was a part of what was lobbied both on the federal and state level. So um, things do happen, you know, when you bring forward your ideas. Um, with uh, Career Source, going through the process of finding a new executive director. So Still? so taking taking our time cuz you so. want to find the right person. So um Mr. Mears doing a good job, you know, getting information out, being on top of things, completing the audit process. We had a clean audit. All of that I think is thank you. All of that is critical. So whomever it is, I think you know you all would really want us to get the right person, you know, as best as we can, you know. Um, so I'm excited about that um, career sources on the right foot moving forward. I know it has some challenges, but we're, we're on the right foot moving forward. And um, I sent a note, uh, email to uh, Julie Marcus and to Ken Burke, but I was on a radio show yesterday, um, and it was a number of topics about my role as a commissioner, but one of the hosts on the radio show is a returning citizen, had been incarcerated for 10 years. Uh, the Tradewind Hotel gave him an opportunity. He became employed there and he started his own business and he complimented the clerk's office for their kindness um, in, you know, when he was going in asking for copies of documents and things of that nature um, so that he can get his voting rights back. He got his voting rights back, so he complimented uh, our supervisor of elections office. Um, so I just sent a little note to them letting them know that this person, you know, interacted with them um, and had a really positive experience. I just believe in, you know, when you say not so nice things, you also say some good things. So um, I just wanted to share that publicly, even though I sent them an individual note letting them know how appreciative that gentleman was and his family about helping him through that. And now he feels like he's a whole return citizen. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Long. Yes. And I cannot believe that you forgot the most important part from your report, Commissioner Flowers. So. I'll be happy to fill in. Okay. Just so you all know, I want to congratulate Commissioner Justice and thank him very much for his service on the Executive oh. Committee oh. of the FAC Board for all of these years that he's been on the County Commission because he very graciously stepped off of that position so that our beloved Commissioner Flowers yeah. uh -huh. can take his place representing our region in the FAC board at the executive level. And now, as a result <coughs> of that, she's on her trajectory to become FAC president in the not too far wow. distant future. So there you have it. Hooray for you. Yay. Yes. And thank you so much. I'm sorry. I did miss that. Commissioner um, Justice and I had a conversation. <coughs> and. And I really appreciate it. And I, I've shared that with him as well. That um, that meant a lot to me to allow me to serve on the um, board when he had been already positioned to serve on there. He and Commissioner Long. So I, I'm very, very thankful. My pleasure. We look forward to great things. Yes. Commissioner Long, anything else? No, I think I'm done for the day. She well, for now. <laughs> for now. All right. Anything else for the good of the order? Uh, just FYI, 337, ba 337 ballots, 337,000 ballots, ballots. Uh, went in the mail today. So if you are a vote-by-mail person, you look to your mailbox it. and uh, return it as soon as possible. All right. All right. Uh, we are in recess. Berry, berry, we'll see berry. you at 6 p.m. Berry, berry, berry. In answer to your question, 
289 vacancies for the Board of Commissioner Departments. So out of 2,185 positions, 289. Wow. Let over, me over, get on a recruiting. Or what? Percent. 55 are advertised. Let me get on a recruitment. I just work here. I don't know. Oh, for what? <laughs> what are the vacancies for? For employment, employment. for different positions Openings. throughout the county. Oh. Mm -hmm. See else? you at 6 o'clock. <laughs> yes, sir.
go ahead and get started. We'll reconvene. We'll open our public hearings. We'll go straight to item 35. Okay. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Agenda item number 35 is case number CW22-12. This is a proposal by the City of Clearwater to amend the countywide plan map from retail and services to activity center regarding 6.15 acres more or less located at U.S. Highway 19 North, <coughs> approximately 1,170 feet south of Sunset Point Road. The public hearing was properly advertised and affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the authority to be heard. Commissioners, desires to hear presentation? I have uh, one card for the applicant, only if there's questions. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on this item? We'll close the public hearing. Wishes of the board? Move approval. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Gerard, second from Commissioner Flowers. The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Commissioner Long, did you want to register a vote? I'm sorry. Did you want to register <coughs> a vote on this? Yes, I do. Yes. My yes. Passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item 36, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Agenda item number 36 is case number CW22-13. This is a proposal by the City of Clearwater to amend the county-wide plan map from public, semi-public to residential low-medium regarding 0.275 acre located at 609 Blanche B. Little John Trail. Public hearing was properly advertised and affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the authority to be heard. Again, desire to see a presentation? No. I have cards from the city and from Ford Pinellas staff if questions arise. Anyone else wishing to testify? We'll close the public hearings. Wishes of the board? Move approval. Second. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Long. The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes unanimously. Item 37. Agenda item number 37 is case number CW22-14. This is a proposal by the City of the Needon to amend the countywide plan map from public semi-public to recreation open space regarding 8.97 acres located at 1900 San Mateo Drive. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the authority to be heard. And it's a, a beautiful piece right off the hammock, <coughs> the uh, southern edge of the hammock. So they're going to add to that uh, mm -hmm. 80 acres of park. So it's okay. really nice. <coughs> Anyone else wishing to testify on this item? All right, we'll close the public hearing. Wishes of the board? Move approval, approval, Mr. Chair. Motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Long. The com uh, clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes unanimously. Item 38. Agenda item number 38 is a proposed resolution to adopt a non ad valorem role under the state of Florida's uniform non ad valorem collection method related to a special assessment for the completed dredging of the Hidden Cove 2 Oak Street retention area in unincorporated Clearwater. The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. All right. Um, we do have a uh, public comment. Um, Casella Kazanowska, did I come close? Isabella. Isabella, I apologize. Please come forward. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for helping me to pay for the cleaning the pond, but in my opinion, all streets are supposed to contribute to, to the payment. The pond wasn't clean since 1973. And on the street is 14 houses. And right now, I and my neighbors has to pay for it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Commissioners, any questions? Right. Thank you very much for being here. Further questions, discussion? Of approval. Second. A motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Eggers. The clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. And it passes unanimously. Item 39. 
Agenda item number 39 is the second of two public hearings to consider a proposed resolution to approve the fiscal year 2022-2023 annual action plan and to authorize actions related to the administration and operation of the Community Development Block Grant, Home Investment Partnerships, and Emergency Solutions Grant Programs. The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing, has been received. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Bussey, uh, there's an amendment to the language we have on our agenda item. Yes, good evening. Bruce Bussey, Housing Community Development Department. Um, we do have a minor change to the recommendations for the action plan projects. Um, we received information recently that Grace House is going to be changing the use of their property. So we have pulled that project from the project recommendation and moved those funds to two other projects. So I have a handout for you that summarizes that change and an updated attachment of the projects. Very good. So both of the funding recommendations for Grace House will <coughs> hold the operational as well as the capital? Correct. Okay. We're splitting the funds um, for that project between CDBG and ESG, and so we're pulling those two projects. So <coughs> while you pass that out, I'll read it. <coughs> the recommended approval is an is amendment by removing the funding recommendation for Hope Villages of America Grace House Operations Activity, reallocating $33,363 of CDBG funding to Operation PAR facility reconstruction project and $25,086 of ESG funding to homeless and homeless uh, prevention services program. So that's the recommendation for the change. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to make sure I have the right thought process. Grace is the one that uh, they did not receive their funding from JWB as they had typically, and they looked at redoing their, uh, okay. Um, and my only other question is, um, so how did you determine how you wanted to spread out the dollars that you were transferring? Was it someone who was next on the roll up or, you know, right. someone who didn't quite right. score, you know, but. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, again, there were two funding sources that we were combining. Um, we had the CDBG allocation, and so we looked at those dollars and we looked at the next alternative project. It wasn't enough to fund that. Okay. So we added those funds to the Operation PAR project to try to move that one forward a little bit quicker. That project is multi-phased. We were going to fund the demolition this year. We added those additional dollars to that project so they could also start with design for the um, expansion of their facility. Okay. And then and with the ESG funds, we added those to our homeless prevention program, which is administered by HEP. And so those dollars will go for um, homeless prevention and re rehousing. Okay. And um, it may have been a, a somewhat different circumstance. I recall some of our ESG dollars were not expended because we were able to use some other dollars in their place. So um, did we have any, were there any programs that applied for dollars that we funded who may not have used all of their funding from the last cycle? Um, <clears throat> this plan allocates all available funding that we have, that from, you have available. for the upcoming year. Okay. We also use this application cycle as an opportunity to seek additional applications for the special allocations, the ESG CV and the CDBG CV funding. So we were able to allocate some of those funds okay. during that That's process. That's what I was going with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. T. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Seal. Um, my only question is about the Neighborhood Family Center. I know Maddie Williams needs the expansion, but do we put it out to the other neighborhood family centers to make sure that that's almost a competitive process in some way? Because um, they all, the neighborhood family centers could, could probably be holding their hand up saying, I need dollars as well. And they should. <clears throat> we, you know, we certainly publicize the application process. We hold it on, on a public hearing and in January, we invite, we invite nonprofit agencies um, to that to hear needs, but we, um, we do send direct correspondence about the open applications to all the nonprofit um, providers that we um, that we keep a record of and we list. There are the CDBG requirements, so um, each facility would have to be able to demonstrate that they're serving low and moderate income populations. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, but, are there specific <clears throat> but we only said. We send it to the not-for-profit list that we have on file, but have we made sure that it's inclusive? We update that annually. We also advertise the application process in the newspaper. Um, 
posted on, on the website, so. Mm -hmm. I know, I just want to make sure that it's, I mean, many not-for-profits wouldn't think about this as a source of funding unless they already knew about it. Um, you know, JWB has a list of not-for-profits that they fund, mm -hmm. and including they fund all the neighborhood family centers. I just want to make sure that that was somewhat competitive. That you, you could check with, you, you could combine the list and make sure that what JWB has is also on our list for mailing it out. I'm pretty sure that most nonprofits know about CDBG dollars. <laughs> and it's, I mean, I don't know about all eight family centers, but I know several over the years have gotten, I mean, the one I, you know, <coughs> the one in Wellman got the property next door, gosh, four or five years ago, um, and expanded their green space that, and, and that kind of stuff. But I, all eight centers, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And the High Point Family Center was constructed primarily with CDBG funds. So over the years, right. we have funded a variety of, of the community centers. I mean, actually, they administratively, it can be difficult for them because CDBG money is not the easiest to administer and right. to continue reporting on. So it could be that they don't want to <coughs> over that hurdle. Further questions? Discussion or motion? Move approval. Second. second. We have a motion from Commissioner Flowers, second from Commissioner Gerard. Clerk will open the board. Commissioners will proceed to vote. Passes unanimously. Anything else for the good of the order? And you're faster than I thought we would be. <laughs> yeah, I knew it would be quick, but not this quick. Very good. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.